Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it goes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel... A on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. is Talk Today with Nick Wallace and Rosie Wright. Good morning, it's six o'clock on Thursday the 8th of February. Good morning, you're with Talk Today on your TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. Pressure for an apology. Rishi Sunak is accused of stirring up the trans debate whilst the mother of murdered trans teen Brianna Jai was visiting Parliament. A protest crackdown. People who climb on war memorials or try to hide their identity during demonstrations could face jail under new government plans. And William's wingman, the Prince of Wales, teams up with Tom Cruise at a charity fundraiser, thanking supporters as he appears in public for the first time since the King's cancer diagnosis. And we're looking at disruptive weather to end the week as rain, sleet and snow push their way northwards. All the details coming up shortly. But first, let's get the headlines with Emily. Thank you, Rosie. Good morning. Stark warnings have been made by scientists after global warming exceeded 1.5 degrees Celsius over a year for the first time. Nine years ago, world leaders had promised to try and limit the long-term temperature rise to that figure. Scientists say it's a crucial limit if we want to avoid the most damaging impacts of climate change. And it comes as Labour is set to announce a major U-turn on its big environment policy later. It's to ditch its plan to spend £28 billion a year on green investment. But party sources insist the green prosperity plan isn't being dropped altogether. There are growing calls for the Prime Minister to apologise to the family of murdered trans teenager Brianna Jai after being accused of making degrading comments in Parliament yesterday. Brianna's mother Esther was present at Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak said Labour leader Sakir Starmer had U-turned on his definition of a woman. It came shortly after he paid tribute to her murdered daughter. Brianna's father says what the Prime Minister did was absolutely dehumanising. The Prince of Wales has thanked the public for their messages of support since his father, the King, was diagnosed with cancer. William was seen undertaking public duties for the first time yesterday since his wife Catherine underwent surgery. He expressed his gratitude at a star-studded charity fundraiser for London's Air Ambulance, which was attended by Hollywood royalty Tom Cruise. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you also for the kind messages of support for Catherine and for my father, especially in recent days. It means a great deal to us all. But William didn't see his uh, didn't see Prince Harry in his fleeting visit to see his father. The Duke of Sussex is now back in California. And two amber warnings for snow and ice come into force this morning in North Wales and northwest Shropshire. It's the start of plunging temperatures expected for much of the country going into the weekend, with heavy snow and warnings of travel disruption and possible power cuts on the way. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour. Thank you very much, Emily. So uh, we're asking questions this morning, particularly about what Rishi Sunak said in Parliament and whether or not he should apologise after the trans jai. Yes, it was a really awkward exchange. I think that's the, the very best way you could describe it uh, in uh, Prime Minister's questions Should we set yesterday? the context just in case people Please weren't do, watching yes. Prime Minister's questions yesterday? Uh, Brianna Jai's mother was in Parliament uh, for Prime Minister's questions. She has been obviously speaking uh, to politicians about what happened to uh, Brianna. And uh, there during Parliament, Rishi Sunak made what was an attempt, I think, at a rather clunky joke, uh, which you might say had nothing to do with Brianna Jai. He took the mickey out of uh, previous flip-flops that uh, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, had said in the past, uh, including his one comment that 99% of women don't have a penis, which then changed to 99.9% of women don't have a penis. <laughs> yeah, so the Prime Minister often makes these sort of a attack lines at uh, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, but potentially in very poor taste yesterday, considering the context. So let us know what you think. Should the Prime Minister apologise after that jibe? Um, let's take a look at what happened. 
Mr Speaker, this week the unwavering bravery of Brianna Jay's mother, Esther, has touched us all. As a father, I can't even imagine the pain that she's going through, and I'm glad that she's with us in the gallery here today. But it's a bit rich, Mr Speaker, to hear about promises from someone who's broken every single promise he was elected on. I mean, I think I counted almost 30 in the last year. Pensions, planning, peerages, public sector pay, tuition fees, childcare, second referendums, defining a woman. Although, although in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. Of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, shame. Shame. Well, should the Prime Minister apologise for that? Do get in touch with us. Talk today at talk.tv. Let's speak to our political correspondent about this, Alicia Fitzgerald. Uh, Alicia, is this a storm in a teacup or is this a potentially damaging row for the Prime Minister? Well, the thing is, obviously, he made this joke. Whether it was a joke or not, that's the thing that's really up for debate. And lots of people are just saying that the timing of it was the issue. Wherever you sit on this trans debate as a whole and whatever you think about Keir Starmer's stance on it, was this really the time to make that joke in the gallery, in the public chamber, when the mother of Brianna Jai was there? Now, Rishi Sunak's spokesman after the PMQs insisted that he didn't need to apologise. He said that this it was a very important thing that, that Rishi Sunak was bringing up. You know, Keir Starmer doesn't know what a woman is, and this is something that the Prime Minister really needed to ask him about. But when lots of journalists were asking, you know, what, about the timing, they just really, really were not keen on apologising for it. I think that's where people are taking issue. Yeah, um, Kemi Badenoch came out in support of the Prime Minister. What kind of argument was she making? She has basically said that Keir Starmer, by, you know, accusing Rishi Sunak of, of, of making this poorly timed joke, was actually just weaponising this. So she's basically said that Keir Starmer... I'm actually going to... I'll read some of her tweet because I don't want to... don't want to misquote her. It was shameful of Starmer to link his own ability to be clear on a matter of sex and gender directly to her grief. Keir Starmer's behaviour today shows Labour are happy to weaponise this issue when it suits them. So she's taken that very hardline stance to this, basically said that this is Keir Starmer's fault, not the Prime Minister's fault. So both parties, in essence, have politicised this and are blaming each other. Definitely. And now this begs the question of whether those tweets that Kemi actually put out, were they approved by number 10? Did they know she was going to say mm. this? And is this the general party line? Do all of the Conservative Party think this way? Or was this Kemi acting alone and maybe speaking out on her own? So if that wasn't the case, it makes it quite hard for Rishi Sunak now to come forward and apologise and say, well, actually, no, no, I put my hands up. This was my fault. I shouldn't have said that. When Kemi Badenoch has come forward and, and accused Starmer of the issue. I mean, there are essentially two separate things going on here, aren't there? There is whether or not Rishi Sunak should have made this uh, comment to Keir Starmer, who has had difficulty defining what a woman was in the past, and whether it was right to say it when you are in the presence of someone who had a trans child who was then murdered. And... There are question marks over Rishi Sunak's uh, political antenna, particularly in the light of what happened with the Piers Morgan interview the other day when he accepted a bet over flights to Rwanda. Definitely. So, as you say, there are two sides of this. And I think that the first part of it, whether or not people think it's right that Rishi Sunak asked Keir Starmer about this, I think most people would say that's fine. In a normal day, it's an OK thing to, to quiz Keir Starmer on. That's what he, they do in, in PMQs. They kind of attack each other at the easiest possible open goals that they have. And that is an attack line that's come up before, It is. This it? isn't yeah. the first time. Yeah. This comes up all the time. So, I mean, that in itself hasn't really caused a whole lot of drama before this. But in light of what's happened, and when the mother of Brianna Jai is in the room... It just begs the question of whether Rishi Sunak is really self-aware enough. I mean, that's the big thing, you know. Have, have you misjudged that or did you do mm. that deliberately? Maybe he's been a bit unwise and, and that's some of the criticism that's been levelled at him for accepting that bet from Piers Morgan as well, as you, as you said, Nick. Um, this isn't going to go away, is it? I mean, at the same time, you've got sort of uh, this very, very difficult debate that's been happening politically and then Rishi Sunak, it appears maybe making blunders, this gives the Labour Party more ammunition. Well, absolutely. So we also learned late last night that Labour will be ditching that £28 billion of green investment spending. So really, it would have just been an easy day for the Conservatives today. They could have absolutely hammered them on that. But sadly, the legacy of PMQs yesterday is really taking the spotlight over this green pledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, it was only this week that Keir Starmer said that it was absolutely essential that they had this, or it was desperately important. I can't remember exactly the phrasing, but very much said the green investment was significant. Mm -hmm. um, 
that is, a, a, for the Conservatives at least, uh, the sort of political game has changed not in their favour despite that uh, Labour pledge. Um, shall we talk about protest powers? Because a new announcement from the Home Secretary today that is like another further crackdown on protesting. What is it? So James Cleverly is exploring the idea of giving police further powers to crack down on protests. So this would include uh, the ability to arrest protesters that climb on statues and monuments during protests and also arrest people wearing face coverings. And this obviously all comes in light of the pro-Palestine protests that we've seen for a good few months now. Um, obviously, Suella Brahman, the former Home Secretary, and now the, the current Home Secretary, James Cleverly, both taking a very firm stance on this and saying that lots of them really just exploit some of the rules that they'd like to see in power. So what James Cleverly is suggesting is just giving the police stronger powers to clamp down on this. Obviously, there is a bit of criticism, you know, Obviously, people do have the free right to protest and you don't really want to intervene on that. So there'll be some questions about how hard you go with it. OK, well, let's uh, bring in Victor Elisa, who's a former senior police officer. Good morning, Victor. You obviously studied uh, what these new proposals are. Would you support it, making it illegal to climb on things? Yes, good morning. Thank you for uh, inviting me onto the programme. Uh, absolutely, yes, unquestionably, because... If you look at the, um, the, the, the comments from the Home Secretary, the comments from the National Police Chiefs Council and senior police officers, a small minority of people who protest break away from the majority of protesters to carry out these activities which are illegal, which are disrespectful, and which well, at hang, the moment... Hang on a minute. Are they disrespectful or are they illegal? I mean, that, that's, that's, that's where you've sort of got to put this dividing line, haven't you? Is climbing on things oh, of isn't course. necessarily illegal, but it is incredibly disrespectful. Do you, do you turn that disrespect into a criminal offence? Well, I, I think that's what the government's trying to do, to give the police the powers to be able to actually remove people doing these things. So, so th there is a fine line between illegality and disrespect, but what that then does is actually the majority of people who want to protest, the point they're trying to make is lost because a small minority is actually creating disruption which detracts from the legitimate process. And I think that's important. You know, we're in a democracy. If people want to protest, they want to do so peacefully, then they should have the right to be able to do so, and the police should be able to actually make sure they can do so safely. What about the face covering issue? Because that's an altogether knottier area. And, and you do find that if you give the police power to do one thing, it's not long before they're either overreaching or they're using it in the wrong context. That, that's always a risk, and that's a risk that's been borne out through history. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the face covering was a, um, an amendment to the Stop and Search Act which actually prevented people or police officers to ask people who went, who were in the place to commit an offence to remove face covering. But police officers didn't have the power to do anything more other than ask them to remove it, but they could actually then formulate powers uh, of arrest, of detention, if they actually had evidence to suspect they were going to commit a criminal offence. But this now addition to the legislation gives police that specific power to ask people to remove face coverings. If they don't remove face coverings, there's a power of arrest and then there's a sanction of, of, of the fine of £1,000. So I think it plugs, well, I don't think it definitely plugs a loophole and will make it easier for police officers to be able to deal with people who go to protest to be disruptive. I guess in, in some senses, a protest has to be disruptive to be effective. Well, not necessarily. I mean, I think you can go into a protest and you can cause some inconvenience. And I think that's the whole nature of protesting. If you have large groups of people actually walking down the road peacefully and then vehicles can't move and people can't get to where they want to go, I think that's, that, that's acceptable. But I think when you get small numbers, and the Home Office have said this and senior police have said this, small numbers of people who deliberately want to cause damage, who deliberately want to detract from the peaceful protest, I think it's only right that we should be able to actually allow the majority to make their point but stop the minority causing damage, uh, which they have done at some occasion, uh, but to give the police the powers to be able to do that. Now, there's one thing, given the police the powers to be able to actually deal with these minority in the majority, but you, got, you know, the, the practical aspects of that are not going to be easy if you have a large group of people who are peacefully protesting, you've got a small group who want to disrupt. The police will have to find a way of getting into that large group to arrest, to remove face masks, to give them fixed penalty notices if there's no power of arrest. That's hugely resource intensive. So um, the powers are great, but I think we have to wait and see what it's like in practice 
at demonstrations and see how effective those powers can be used to meet the government's uh, wishes to actually stop the small minority of people who are causing disruption at uh, demonstrations and processions, as, as is described in the addition to the legislation. Victor, thank you very much. Alicia, as well, thank you for giving us the context earlier. And let us know this morning what you think. Is it right that the police should have more power to arrest protesters? You can text us 87222. Just start your message with the word talk. And we'll take a look at those throughout the programme. First of all, let's look at this morning's front pages that we're waking up to this morning. And The Times is reporting uh, on an alleged Russian spy that they say infiltrated Britain, gaining access to MI6, the Foreign Office, and even meeting the future King Charles. Shame on you, says the Mirror, as the Prime Minister is accused of being tone deaf, making a trans joke whilst the mother of murder trans teen Brianna Jai visited Parliament. And the sun go with top sun as Prince William poses with Hollywood actor Tom Cruise at a charity fundraiser last night. That's his first public engagement since his father's cancer diagnosis. Let's stick with that story because in the studio with us shortly is our royal editor. But first, we thought we'd give you a bit of a glimpse of some of what the Prince of Wales had to say last night. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you also for the kind messages of support for Catherine and for my father, especially in recent days. It means a great deal to us all. Uh, joining us now is Talk TV's royal editor, Sarah Houston. Sarah, Prince William seemed to be stepping up whilst his father receives treatment. We saw an example of it there last night. Lots of attention on him. How did he do? Yeah, and it's the first time we've seen him for about three weeks, actually, since he stepped back from public duties after Kate was taken into hospital and had abdominal surgery. So yesterday was the first time we'd seen him out in public and he addressed and acknowledged what had been going on in the royal family in recent weeks and he thanked the public, as you heard there, for their kind wishes about the king and about his wife, uh, Catherine. A and he also cracked a joke about Tom Cruise uh, being there and suggested he didn't take off the new helicopters uh, for a spin. It was a London Air Ambulance fundraising gala. Prince William's been patron of that charity since 2020, having been an air ambulance pilot in East Anglia himself. So I think it was good to see him Big smile on his face, uh, looking like he was having uh, a good time and, and also referring to the medical focus, as he described it, of recent weeks with a, a, a gag about, you know, deciding to escape it by coming to an air ambulance function. <laughs> it, the, part of this is that he's going to take on a lot more responsibility, mm -hmm. perhaps more than he'd wanted to at this point. Yes, and I think that's the difficult thing about this. Um, there's never a good time for anything like this to happen, is there? But it is particularly challenging Two for the health crises family. at the same time. Two health yeah. crises at the same time, with uh, Catherine going to be off duty until Easter. Uh, and now William, who had wanted to take a bit of a back seat, with his father's blessing, actually, to give his wife support and look after their three young children, now having to step up and be the kind of focal point for the royal family now as the king steps back. Do you know what? It felt like a bit of stability, didn't it? I think that's why that was really important, yeah. actually, Nick. It's a very good point. It was really important and very much choreographed that we saw him out in public yesterday. And a lot of... I mean, it was jovial, wasn't it? I didn't know necessarily that him and Tom Cruise had such a close relationship. And, and it is a great photo on the front page of The Sun <laughs> as well, I mean, isn't the wingmen. Yeah. 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 Well, Tom Cruise said, you can be my wingman anytime. anytime. They've met on a couple of occasions um, at the Top Gun Maverick premiere. Uh, William and Kate attended that with uh, Tom Cruise. And William then even wore some Top Gun slippers that got a lot of attention. He mentioned he wasn't wearing those last night. Tom Cruise is a big fan of the royal family. He was here and made a surprise appearance at the Platinum Jubilee at the pageant uh, at Windsor, uh, a big fan of the late Queen, uh, and clearly uh, supporting that charity that's very important to Prince William last night. One son getting a lot of positive press, another less so. Prince Harry on his way back home. It, it really was a flying visit. Yeah, although I don't know that the press has been entirely negative about Prince Harry, because I think the, the feeling is that he did absolutely the right thing as a son. Having received the news about his father's diagnosis, he flew straight over to visit his father. What has raised eyebrows is the length of that visit and the amount of FaceTime he got with his father, between 30 and 45 minutes uh, with his dad. And what did that say about the state of relations? 
I think, by all accounts, the king was very pleased to see his son, delayed his departure to Sandringham in order to be there at Clarence House when Harry arrived, but a rather different picture when it comes to Harry and William at no time for a meeting between those two brothers. Isn't it? It's, it's very odd life and a very odd contrast, the way that Harry flies in, has his 30 minutes, flies back, job done, and then Prince William is obviously front and centre as, you know, as the heir to the throne, I guess he would be, but that contrast is made more stark. I wonder whether, whether the long-term effect of this will be a gradual move towards rapprochement. Because if you're saying the general feeling is that Harry did the right thing, and certainly the king was appreciative of it, who knows what happens next time? Yeah, and I, I think it, it, what happens over the coming days and weeks will be really significant. Whether that meeting between Harry and the king means greater communication by telephone, FaceTime, for example, uh, from between California and Sandringham. That would be a, a step in the right direction. It's also about whether there are any leaks of those conversations, because the royal family are really concerned that private conversations that they have had have ended up in the public domain, whether that's in an interview or whether that's in a book or whether that's in a documentary series. If that remains private, the conversation between Harry and his father, then that's certainly a first step on rebuilding that trust and enabling further conversations For to sure. happen. Talking about conversations that are, are taking place, we saw uh, the late Queen Elizabeth on Zoom, um, yes. but the King, it looks like, when he has his audiences with the Prime Minister, that's going to be done uh, on the landline. Yes. He's quite old school. Very old, <laughs> the King <laughs> Charles. Not Zoom for him. No, he doesn't even own a mobile phone. Right. Um, which is one factor which makes communication with his son Harry a little bit difficult. More because you have to come through the switchboard. Mm. Um, but, yes, so uh, the King has gone to Sandringham in Norfolk. He's not in London now, and we're going to see that as a regular pattern. He'll return to London for his treatment and then his recuperation will take place in Sandringham, surrounded by the countryside, which I think is where he's at his happiest. And so that weekly audience with the Prime Minister, which took place yesterday, we were told took place by telephone. I mean, reasons of geography as well. But we did, as you say, saw the late Queen embracing uh, video uh, calls during uh, the pandemic. We might have expected that to happen. I don't know why or whether uh, the King just feels more comfortable with a good old-fashioned telephone. Right. Oh, we all get fed up with Zoom sometimes. Yeah. You have to make the effort, <laughs> yes. don't you? Sometimes just an old-fashioned chat on exactly. the phone. That's the way to do it. Sarah, thank, uh, thank you, you so much. much. Sarah Houston, our royal editor, really appreciate your time. Uh, um, lots to come here on the programme on Talk Today. How did an alleged Russian spy gain access to Britain's most secure locations? And could Boris Johnson make a political comeback? Writer Emma Wolfe and journalist James Bloodworth are here to take us through this morning's papers. Do stay with us. It's 21 minutes past six. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet... Multiple of... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press... Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a crossbow's like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? <laughs> <laughs> there we go, on the show. <laughs> it's carry on, what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, it's... Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. 
Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. It's 25 minutes past six. Now, we'll have the weather for you in just a moment. Here's what else is coming up in the programme. How an alleged Russian spy infiltrated Britain's intelligence and even managed to meet King Charles. That's in the papers. Next. Just before nine, we'll be asking if it's right that controversial American journalist Tucker Carlson is interviewing hostile world leader President Putin. And at 9.15, as the backlash against Rishi Sunak intensifies, we'll be asking a trans campaigner if he should apologise for his joke whilst the mother of murdered teenager Brianna Jai was visiting. First, let's take a look at the weather. Joe is here. Joe, snow has started to fall. It has. It has. I mean, where to start with the weather today? There's so much going on. You're probably aware that we've got this battle between the cold air in the north and the milder air to the south. Add into the mix an area of low pressure and voila, it's a bit of chaos today. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Yes, overnight we've seen rain moving its way into the southwest. Some of this rain is very heavy, and of course it's running straight into some very cold air. Here's our area of low pressure, the centre of it out towards the west, and the frontal systems running up across the country, bringing a good deal of rain. In fact, that low pressure system is going to stay with us right the way across the weekend, and it's going to be the middle of next week before we start to see things uh, calming down a little bit as high pressure builds in. But certainly for today, it's cold and bright over parts of uh, Scotland. We've got a warning out here. In fact, so many warnings today, several of them amber. Now, this is mostly for North Wales, also for the Pennines, where we're likely to see, in some places, around 25 centimetres of snow. That's up over the higher ground, obviously. And to go with that, we've got these very strong easterly winds. So it's going to uh, create some blizzard-type conditions, really tricky travel conditions. And even where we don't have the snow, we're likely to see some significant rain, some torrential downpours to come in that as well. Now, of course, as that rain makes its way northwards, it's pulling in that milder air. So we could see 12 or 13 degrees Celsius down in the south, whereas we'll have single figures elsewhere. But also, as that uh, rain continues to push its way northwards, over parts of Wales, after the snow, we could see some freezing rain. So very, very dangerous conditions indeed. And that wet weather stays with us uh, through the night. The warning down towards the south is for rain. It remains in place till 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Again, some parts could see up to two inches of rainfall in some places. Quite a cold night to come in areas. That rain pushing its way northwards into Scotland and again giving some snow over the higher ground, even to some lower levels there. And the showers and the rain just keep coming. So for Scotland tomorrow, we'd like to see some uh, snow, particularly over those eastern areas. Pretty chilly out towards the west. Some rain as well for northeastern parts of England, down towards the south. It's going to be a mix of cloud and shower. Some of those showers merging together to give some longer spells of rain and also could give some torrential downpours in places, but uh, an awful lot milder than uh, we've seen over the last few days. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. That was an exhausting weather forecast because there's a lot of exhausting weather about. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, now, writer Emma Wolfe and journalist James Bloodworth are with us for a look through this morning's papers. Uh, let's start with the front... Good morning to you both. Sorry, yeah, very rude. Uh, the, the, let's have a look at the front page of The Times, James, first of all. This is a good, proper paper story, this, about a court case involving an alleged Russian spy. 
Yeah, so it's the Times is saying that a Putin spy has infiltrated Britain's intelligence service. So it was it was a, someone who claimed asylum um, in Britain who uh, basically worked as a double agent. He's now been sp- stripped of his British citizenship. He's an Af- Afghanistan national at birth. Is that right? Yes, that's yeah. right. And and he's been accused of of spying for Russia's military intelligence agency and also working for GCHQ and MI6 in the UK. So I mean, this is an ongoing problem. Russia's been on a Cold War footing. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, it hasn't. It hasn't. It, we, we're only just catching on now to the fact that it's still trying to infiltrate our own intelligence services, our military. Um, some would say uh, the House of Lords, for example, by newspapers in this country. Um, and this is another example of that. I mean, the, um, the allegations in here are that he was being groomed from the age of five. Yeah, really. I mean, this is um, this is this is one of the things the Russian uh, intelligence services have done. So, I mean, last year I interviewed Greg Hans, who's now the chairman of the Conservative Party, and there was an attempt at one point before he was an MP to recruit him and get him to take documents from the House of Commons wow. Library. There have been prospective Tory MPs taken over to, to Russia and um, attempt to take them to a strip club at one point. And yeah, I mean, every every uh, area of public life, the Russians are are attempting to infiltrate at the moment. We know this, but when you see the details, it does feel alarming. The, the amount of access that these people um, and, the, and the influential people they gain uh, influence with is, is yeah. really quite stark. It is, and I also think this sort of feeds into the narrative at the moment that the Home Office, in terms of their monitoring and in terms of surveillance for any kind of immigration issues, is not fit for purpose. We've seen so many of these cases over recent weeks, and obviously we still have Abdul um, Shakur on the run. So, uh, sorry, Abdul Azidi um, on the run. So um, this feeds into that. But also it's difficult with Russia, isn't it? Because there is a sort of side of them which is very much accepted and is in our society and the Russian money and all of that and the kind of the, the blurred lines between going to strip clubs and going out whining and dining and then the kind of full-on, you know, yeah. Russian infiltration. I mean, we do, as you say, we have, you know, uh, what do they call the um, guy who owns the Evening Standard? Uh, Evgeny uh, Leb- Lebedev. The, His yeah, father Lebedev. was a spy. I mean, they're yeah. fully accepted into British society. They're part of our, our you know, yeah, I mean, part it's, of it's, the House of Lords. It's partly because our economy depends on on people with lots of money buying property yeah. in London, it has done. And I mean, Knightsbridge is sort of 99.9% yeah. Russian. To use but the, the, the way to deal with Russia has long been a problem since the end of the Cold War when they it stopped being an enemy. What, what did they cut. become? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, and, exactly. and this is why we're going to be talking about it later on the programme. This interview that Tucker Carlson did yeah. with, with Vladimir Putin yeah. is so contentious because how do you handle Putin if he's sending people into this country? I mean, this, this chap apparently met the king. When he was mm. Prince Charles, mm. and, uh, and and he had developed vetting when he worked at GCHQ, so embedded within the secret services and and feeding information, allegedly feeding information, uh, back to the Russian state. We will have more on that uh, interview a little bit later. We believe they've done the interview, but it hasn't been released yet, so it's sort of in the can of being being edited. Um, so more on that to come. Emma, this is a highly sensitive, extremely yeah. controversial subject. Came up in the middle of Prime Minister's questions. Um, the Mirror is saying the Tories are tone deaf. Shame on you. Was the Prime Minister tone deaf yesterday? I think this has been whipped up. I think this has been weaponised by the papers and by Labour as well. Um, this was yesterday, um, Rishi Sunak in the kind of rough and tumble of PMQs making a joke about the fact that Keir Starmer was not able, repeatedly, notoriously, not able to define what was a woman, whether a woman could have a penis, this whole trans row. The so, mer- should, we, should we just be absolutely clear what Rishi Sunak said? He said that one of uh, Starmer's problems was defining a woman, although in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. That's all yeah. he said on the subject. Yeah, exactly. And um, he said, uh, because, because Starmer had previously said 99.9% of women, he, he's moved on his position, he's U-turned, which is what Starmer is also famous for doing, uh, 99.9% of women, OK, yes, they don't have male genitalia. But the problem was, to complicate the issue, um, the parents of, uh, or the mother of uh, Brianna, Brianna Jai was in the chamber, and so this is being seen as a sort of trans jibe, deeply insensitive trans jibe, at a time when they are obviously grieving just after the um, the conviction and the charging of the, of her murderers. What's your uh, take on it, Jane? Sunak has doubled down and refused to apologise, and Labour are whipping it up. I think. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say Labour's whipping it up because the father of Brianna Jai has said that he found this remark disgusting and that Rishi Sunak, Sunak should apologise. I mean, I think there's... Do you think he should apologise? Yeah, I think so. What I for? Be, because I think, he's, I think it's an inappropriate thing to say whilst Bri- Brianna's mother's so in, the in the chamber. it's the insensitivity of it. Yeah, because I think there's, there's a legitimate debate to be had about women's spaces and 
biological reality versus what someone identifies as. Um, but I think you can have that debate without making trans people the butt of the joke, which is precisely what Rishi Sunak did. Well, but they weren't the butt well, of the well, joke. Well, Starmer Brianna's, was. Starmer was for his Well, future. Brianna's father hasn't criticised Starmer. He's criticised yeah. Rishi Sunak I, I for think, making that joke and said I, it's I'm disgusting. Not, I'm not ignoring the parents, but I think that what parents say in the, in the you know, days and weeks following this kind of awful, awful event is one thing, and I completely understand their grief and their very, very sensitive feeling to anything, but it wasn't actually joking about trans people at all. It was a joke about the fact that Keir Starmer has you turned on this and many other issues, which we'll, I'm sure we'll come to in the next story, in the next few stories, um, and that he was finally able to define what was a woman and what wasn't a woman. That's what Sunak was getting at. I think Rishi Sunak then should refrain from, you know, lavishing the parents of Brianna uh, Jai with, with all this praise then if he doesn't actually uh, respect what they say because, because the father has said that he's disgusted by this and thinks he should apologise. So I think, you know, Rishi Sunak should at least reflect on that. Yeah. It doesn't reflect well on him that that's been said, does but it? Maybe it was unwise. The Prime Minister hasn't had a very positive week for headlines or giving the opposition an easy goal to say that you took that bet with Piers Morgan, you've now been deeply insulting in, in the Commons. Um, we're asking you at home this morning, should the Prime Minister apologise? Um, let us know what you think. You can text us, 8722, just start your message with the word talk. The thing that's interesting, Emma, and if we look inside uh, the Telegraph for this, mm. um, is yesterday could have been a really positive day for the Conservatives because the Labour Party, after so much confusion of a policy that was announced months ago, all this funding, green investment, mm. 28 billion, well, then it got very messy. Were they actually going to do this? Were they just mm. going to do it later if they uh, won the general election? Yeah. And now, yesterday, clarity, oh, no, we're abandoning it. Well, they're not... Yes, they're saying they're abandoning it. They're, st they're going to still say the party's committed to huge borrowing, but they're not standing by that precise figure. I think figure. they're committed to not making commitments. Billion. Exactly. <laughs> well, I know, and many, many of us feel that's what Starmer has been doing all along, that he hasn't actually given us any clear policies. The shadow, cabinets, uh, the shadow cabinet is quite um, d divided on this. They are still committed to green investment, to huge green investment. They're still committed to a lot of borrowing. Um, but, yeah, there is an obvious, a clear sense, a clear indication that this pledge is being watered down, has been watered down. And it should have been, as you say, this should have been a brilliant time for the Tories' open goal for them to say, you know what, this party is not, Labour in waiting, is not actually, it doesn't have a credible plan for government. It's not a party fit for, fit for purpose, about ready to take over. Mm. But, of course, it's got confused by all sorts of... Other. Yeah. <laughs> but on the actual Green Pledge issue, are Labour right to abandon that 28 billion total? Have they been boxed into a political corner here? Because the argument was that it was investment, and if you obviously speculate, you accumulate. So could they not have stuck to their guns, or should they not have stuck to their guns here? Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I think it's they, they've rolled back from specifically the 28 billion figure, because then that can't be hung around their necks as a... I mean, I don't think it's very credible for the Tories to say Labour's going to increase taxes when we already have the highest tax burden since the end of the Second World War. So I think that's not... The Conservatives don't have a very strong footing on that, on that score. But I think Keir Starmer's being extremely, extremely cautious. Um, so there's not that figure. Because the, the, the Green policies, this is an industrial strategy, and they haven't rode back from that. They're just not putting a figure on it, so it, exactly. it makes it harder to Doesn't actually want to attack be a hostage them on it. to fortune. Yeah. And then they'll come back and say, "Well, we don't have, we, you know, we're not in the, we, we can't get inside the treasury yet." It's this endless kind of, we won't know until we're actually the challenge of saying the we don't have all the details, so therefore exactly. we can't give fully costed ideas. Exactly. And then when they do, the Conservatives come at them, so it's a slightly tricky balance they're trying to play. You use the word cautious, James, but for the public, is that going to be enough? Because what they really want is clarity. Yeah, I mean, I think it probably will because, I mean, the, the Labour's had a four, four, been at 40% for over 18 months now. So, I mean, it's overly cautious. He probably doesn't need to be this cautious. But at the same time, it's, it's, not, it's not completely wrong either because if the Tories do unveil tax cuts to try and sweeten the electorate, then we don't know how the public finances are going to be, uh, you know, in nine months' time. So, I mean, you, you can't always, you know, put a figure on it now because you don't know what the government's going to do in the meantime. And although many, many people know that we need investment and we need more green policies, with the public, it's not overwhelmingly a popular thing to yeah. say we're going to, as you say, raise your taxes to spend £28 billion on green investment. That doesn't go down well with voters. So that... They really don't want to... They don't want to take this lead, this massive lead, for granted. OK, very quickly, one more story. This is on the front page of the Daily Express, Emma. Has the Prime Minister opened the door to an amazing Boris comeback? Yeah, well, this is actually James's story, um, isn't it, about uh, the Prime Minister saying that he wouldn't rule out 
uh, Boris Johnson having a role. I think it was having a role in the uh, future. I was always taught yeah. that when the headline's got a question mark on the end of it, try the answer no. And also, a stunning move, you think, come on. Yeah, <laughs> really? It feels, it feels a bit of a kind of... It, they've invented this, this uh, as a story. <laughs> yes. it's, I mean... Right. Because he actually said not a lot. Yeah, and his, his, his reputation kind of collapsed with Partygate. I think he had... He was at minus... His favourability was minus 42 um, when he left office. Um, I, I think Rishi Sunak is, you know, very unpopular, but he's not that unpopular yet. I just think that would be quite crazy. I think, why would he do that? I mean, he's brought Cameron back. Cameron was a relatively popular figure, unless you supported Brexit. But he was... Um, Cameron, you know, is, is a kind of seasoned hand. I don't think he'd want that psychodrama of bringing Boris mm. back. And why, it, why it's got too that? much political gravity, hasn't he, that could draw attention away from everything. But also, hang on a minute, what do, who does Sunak think he is? I mean, he's not going to have any power. So it's a kind of interesting question. Has, has the Prime Minister opened the door to a, a Boris com comeback? Well, okay. In what shape or we'll form? We'll just say, Sunak, nice try, Daily it. Express, but yeah. no-one here is buying it. But do, do you think the public would welcome it? Uh, it's an interesting one. Would they welcome Nigel Farage? I mean, we have these really, really popular figures, sort of leaders, who are sort of almost more than politicians. Farage is overwhelmingly popular in some ways, and yet he's failed to be elected, you know, what, seven times. So are they decent politicians? Not really. I mean, are they, are they good or are they just really kind of... I mean, when Farage appeared at the Conservative Party conference, he was absolutely mobbed. When he does I'm a Celebrity, he wins, you know, comes third. He, he is very, very popular. It's like Boris a niche Johnson. popularity, though, I think. Like, it's, they're very popular with true well, believers, but Sunak wants to be that kind of... Cent well, yeah. to present as kind of the centre ground, which you need to they're do to They're very divisive, yeah. You can't just be this niche popular figure. I think Boris right. Johnson's Marmite, isn't he? Indeed. Yeah. Well, look, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed to both Emma and James. They'll be back in just under an hour. You've been getting in touch with your opinions. We asked you whether or not the PM, the Prime Minister, should apologise after making an alleged trans jibe in Parliament yesterday. Uh, Mark has emailed in to say... He wasn't wrong. The parents are being used as political pawns and that is more disrespectful than what Rishi Sunak said. Well, Brian says Starmer was disgusting for bringing Brianna into the argument. And Stephen has something similar to say. Starmer was the one who used Brianna's name to try and get political gain in the first place. And uh, another Mark says, why should uh, Sunak apologise? It's Starmer who doesn't know what a woman is. Well, uh, that's very much a clear consensus from those messages. If you've got a different view or just want to kind of add to the debate, we'll be talking about this across uh, the programme. I'm sure it's going to dominate the political conversation as well today. Um, get in touch. You can email us as well, Talk today at Talk. TV. Let's go to the US now. And there's been an unprecedented legal case. A jury has found a school shooter's mother guilty of manslaughter for failing to stop him. It is a fascinating case. This Jennifer Crumbly is the first parent convicted in this way in the United States. She and her husband, who is facing the same charges in a separate trial, bought the gun used by their son to kill four of his classmates at a high school in Michigan. We're joined now by forensic psychiatrist Dr. Soham Das. Uh, good morning, Dr. Das. What were the warning signs that Ethan parents were accused of ignoring in this case? Morning to both of you. So I actually think this case is quite unique because there were so many of them. They were so clear. You know, Ethan had plotted this attack well in advance. He'd outlined a journal, um, his intentions in a journal, and he wasn't being cryptic. You know, he directly said that he had this desire to shoot up the school, to harm people. He recorded his intentions in two videos before the shooting. He put lots of menacing posts out on social media. And, you know, everybody was aware. The school had written to his parents just a few weeks before the before the incident they raised concerns a couple of times twice i think i believe in the days leading up to the shooting and even on the very morning of the shooting Crumbly's parents had met with school staff at the school and instead of really uh, divulging the whole issues to the school they just uh, dismissed the situation and went to work and on top of all of that his parents actually bought him a semi-automatic handgun as a gift merely days before the shooting uh, and they didn't even store it correctly. So I think it's fair to say that in this case, there were clear red flag warning signs. Yeah, so uh, at what, from your perspective, at what point can you say that someone else bore responsibility for the actions of someone else? So I think it's it's quite a contentious issue. I think it's quite divisive, and there's going to be people that say, you know, that parents aren't aren't really responsible for their children's uh, behaviours, especially if they have really difficult and antisocial kids. Uh, and I can see arguments on both sides, but I do think, you know, when you look at those red flags, they are very very clear. And it's not just that the parents 
ignored them it's almost like they they did the opposite of what they should do you know buying him a handgun uh not setting any kind of boundaries so to answer your question it kind of depends on the case i think in this case it's really hard to to defend her either of the parents in any way i i, I take your point on that but the age of criminal responsibility certainly in this country is 10 and that child was therefore responsible for their actions even though obviously they were having mental health problems i, I wonder what kind of legal precedent th this sets and 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 how in future, this will be viewed because people buy handguns for their children in America. That's what happens. Now, they may have been negligent in the way that that handgun was stored. They may have been negligent in ignoring the warning signs that the school was raising uh, about that child. But there is a principle here, isn't there, which is why this is such a significant case. Yeah, absolutely. And it does set legal precedent. It's the first time that a parent has been held responsible for their child's actions, specifically in relation to a mass shooting. But just going back to, to what you mentioned before about mental health issues, as an expert witness, this is exactly the kind of case that I would assess if somebody's mental health issues uh, make a difference about whether they were actually criminally responsible. So I'm sure you've heard the phrases, you know, diminished responsibility. That was uh, in the news a couple of weeks ago because of the case of Calacane and the Nottingham stabbings. You've probably heard of not guilty by reason of insanity. But the point I would like to make is that the threshold for those psychiatric defences is very, very high. So another way of saying that is that the vast majority of the cases that I assess, even if the individual, regardless of they're an adult or an adolescent, has a mental health issue, that's not enough. They have, the mental illness has to be so severe that it literally is taking over their controls and their actions and their thoughts like deep paranoia or hearing voices. And that I, I don't think that's uh, relevant in this case. What did come up in the case was, but talking about mental health, and it'd be interesting to know your perspective on this, is that Ethan, this is the, the man who conducted the, the shooting, who's obviously been found guilty of that, um, said he wanted help with his, his mental health. How does that play into what happened? Sure. So I suppose it depends on there's, there's a bit of conflicting information. So you're right. He said that he wanted help. Apparently he was hallucinating and he asked for his parents to, to sort him out and get him a, re a referral. In the trial of his mother, Jennifer, she said that she didn't believe he had mental health problems. So I suppose it depends on the authenticity of those symptoms. If he was genuinely having hallucinations, because remember, they could just be his own, his own imagination or his thoughts being spoken out loud. And his parents knew that and they ignored it, then I think it's, it's, it's again, it's really hard to defend that. I think you have to say that, that it was their responsibility to act upon that. It's desperately sad. Uh, Dr. Das, thank you very much indeed for coming on Talk Today this morning. Uh, we're asking several questions this morning, not just about what uh, the Prime Minister said in Question Time yesterday. We're also asking whether or not police deserve more power to arrest protesters. Uh, Colin says the police have the power already. It's selective enforcement that's the problem. Uh, yeah, lots of you getting in touch. Uh, Kai says, I don't want the government infringing on any uh, of my rights. Mark says, the police don't need more powers. They just need to implement the ones they have now without prejudice to one side or another. Mm. Well, a little bit later on today, the Home Secretary will be outlining these changes. It's sort of, I think, the third time now that the, the recent Conservative government have put in a kind of crackdown on protests. So, so let us know... Braverman wants to ban the right to protest, is that right? Yeah, she sort of lost the clout to be able to enact any of those policies <laughs> now, hasn't she? Um, but let us know what you think. You can text us 87222. Just start your message with the word talk. Now, lots to come here. Travel chaos, I'm afraid, if you've been looking at the weather, is perhaps uh, inevitable. Snow and ice has hit parts of the UK already. Uh, will you be affected? Simon Calder has his advice next. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it, they don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet, multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows. Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat. Carry on, a crossbows like a hatchet and what? A sword and a, sword. a knife. 
How is that even technically possible? It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> what? <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, <laughs> I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it goes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. It's 10 to 7. Now, the Met Office has issued two amber weather warnings with snow and ice expected to cover North Wales, parts of Shropshire and the Pennines today. Well, with up to 25 centimetres of snow predicted to fall, the travel expert Simon Calder is here guru. to tell us travel how guru, our Simon journeys <laughs> may be impacted. Simon, good morning. Good morning. So snow on the way always means particularly train services get a bit scuppered. Uh, yes, scuppered is certainly one word for it. I've already been out in what one paper is calling the return of the beast from the east. Oh, is it that bad? It is pretty horrible. I okay. cycled, it was freezing. I got absolutely soaked and it was only thanks to the fantastic makeup team that I... <laughs> Done <laughs> their work. Yeah, Great. they have. So, OK, let, let's start on what's happening with the trains. So we've got, as usual, as commuters are waking up, the usual range of problems. So, for instance, at the problem with the track between Nottingham and Ely, which is causing all, all manner of problems. But later on, there are going to be um, some serious problems. For instance, LNER on the East Coast Main Line from London to Yorkshire, they're actually stopping the trains which normally run through to Skipton, to Bradford, to Harrogate at Leeds, because they say severe weather. There's also going to be problems, can you believe, on the South Coast? They say 55 mile an hour winds. So journeys could take longer, they could be cancelled, and that's going to continue right through till tomorrow. But unfortunately, as you know and I know, problems develop during the day. Um, it's only once the um, uh, snow starts falling in earnest we will know how bad things are but uh, it is going to affect not just today tomorrow all the way through to the evening as well before we move on to the flights this is a what a preemptive cutting of services by lner yes why because they say severe weather so hang on uh, what, what's that snow the wind what, what's, what's yes, the problem uh, the snow whole lot and ice yeah uh, effectively those, those services which run to north and west yorkshire are kind of really nice to have, but there's other trains that will take you there. You just change at Leeds. And oh, I see. Leeds okay. is kind of they're, they're, the trains are all at home in Leeds, and so they don't want to get stuck anywhere nasty on, uh, up in the uh, up in the moors. And, and so. we're just expecting this to get worse during the day as the weather gets. Well, worse. unfortunately, that that's the way that things w tend to happen on the railway. Um, Actually, most many journeys at the moment are doing all right. Mm. Leads to uh, York, there's problems um, with, with a points failure, but that's kind of just mm. uh, disruption as normal. How about the flights then? OK, Ryanair has put out a warning this morning saying uh, snow and ice and bad weather generally across the UK. Uh, you can expect some disruption. Um, the, the good thing if you're uh, an airline passenger is you've got really good rights because if your flight gets cancelled, then the airline has to find another way of getting you to your destination as soon as possible. They also have to provide you with meals and, if necessary, hotel accommodation. It's not too bad today. It's a relatively off-peak day. Things 
could get a bit trickier tomorrow if we have uh, lots of cancellations upon cancellations. And I always keep an eye on Leeds Bradford Airport because that's sort of quite high up and they're quite exposed to quite a lot of weather. There. Yeah, and they're right in the central band yeah. of where the yeah. snow is expected to fall, aren't they? Do you yes. know, Simon, I've spoken to people in the past. Oh, my flight's been cancelled. I think we know. Oh, I've heard the airline's supposed to get me to my destination. Yeah. In practice, what are you actually supposed to do? Because it, it can feel like you're being fobbed off. A really good point. Thank you. Yes. And lots of the airlines, well, they know exactly what the rules are. And it says, if Rose's flight is cancelled, we will find her another flight. And while she's waiting, we'll book her a hotel and we'll give her dinner and so on. Now, not all airlines do what they should do all the time. So if necessary, if you can contact them and say, please, will you get me another flight? And they say, of course we can't. Then you just book it and then claim it back if you've got a robust enough credit card. OK, right, so get the ticket. If they are not sort of being difficult or obstructive or slow to answer the phone, maybe you need to get somewhere quickly, buy another flight and then get yourself reimbursed after. Yes, as long as you've given them a chance to, to sort okay. things out for you. Same thing goes for hotels. Um, Do you know what you just think at that point? I can't be dealing with the admin. Often the yeah. admin associated with the <laughs> yeah. delay is worse than the delay. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, you have to upload all kinds of documents and, and you know, oh, your receipt for your meal. It doesn't show what you actually ate and therefore we're not going to pay it. It goes on for weeks and eventually a lot of people give up, which is a, a cynical what they person would happen. say. Yeah, that's yes. exactly what they're exactly. after. Um, yeah. Looking ahead to the weekend, the weather mm. looks like it might quieten down, yep. but the travel disruption looks like it might continue. Yes, we've got um, the return of some rail strikes. So, for instance, um, we've got uh, cross-country. There's uh, staff working for the uh, rail company in... Edinburgh. Then we've got the usual weekend engineering works, which are going to be quite spectacular on the good old East Coast mainline from Scotland, North East England and Yorkshire to London. So, for example, if you're travelling between Newcastle and London, you'd probably need to go via lovely Sheffield and the journey would take a good 50% longer. Um, then we don't actually get any more really serious rail strikes until the London Overground uh, staff go on strike in a couple of weeks. At the moment, as left, the train drivers union hasn't called any further strikes, but I have checked with all the parties involved. Remember, it only ended a couple of days ago and no progress whatsoever has been made. And so therefore, give it another week or so and you can expect more strikes to be called, which could go on to until um, after an election. Yeah. So um, just just marking your cards there. Sort of deep sigh when we hear about S that. Something to look forward to from Simon. There. <laughs> Simon, thank you so much as ever, travel editor of the Independent, telling us how we can get about. I think that amber weather warning comes into place at eight o'clock. Yeah. So um, that's when the disruption probably starts to get worse. Simon, thank you. There's lots more still to come here on the programme, including. Hopes dashed, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejects a ceasefire deal aimed at freeing hostages from Hamas. We'll speak to a hostage negotiator about what could be done to help them. This is Talk Today. Very good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it this concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. A crossbow, a hatchet... Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a crossbow's like a hatchet and what? A sword and a, sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Oh, 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 there we go on this show. Oh, great. It's carry on what just happened. Oh, wow. It was like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor. Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple, the downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop 
creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it goes. It'd be my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Nick Wallace and Rosie Wright. A very good morning. Welcome back. It is 7 o'clock on Thursday, the 8th of February. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Pressure for an apology. The Prime Minister is accused of stirring up the trans debate whilst the mother of the murdered trans teenager, Brianna Jai, was visiting Parliament. And protest crackdown. People who climb on war memorials or try to hide their identity during demonstrations could face jail under new government plans. And William's wingman, the Prince of Wales, teams up with Tom Cruise at a charity fundraiser, thanking supporters as he appears in public for the first time since the King's cancer diagnosis. And temperatures range from minus 12 in the north today to uh, plus 12 down in the south. And where the cold air meets the uh, milder conditions, we are seeing some heavy rain, also some sleet and snow. All the details coming up shortly. Thanks, Joe. Now let's get your news headlines. Here's Emily. Thank you, Nick. Good morning. There are growing calls for the Prime Minister to apologise to the family of murdered trans teenager Brianna Jai after making what's been described as degrading comments in Parliament yesterday. Brianna's mother, Esther, was present at Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak said that the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, had U-turned on his definition of a woman. It came shortly after he paid tribute to her murdered daughter. Brianna's father says what the Prime Minister did was absolutely dehumanising. The Prince of Wales has thanked the public for their messages of support since his father, the King's, shock cancer diagnosis. William was seen undertaking public duties for the first time yesterday since his wife Catherine underwent surgery. He expressed his gratitude at a star-studded charity fundraiser for London's Air Ambulance, which was attended by Hollywood royalty Tom Cruise. But William didn't see Prince Harry in his fleeting visit to see his father. The Duke of Sussex is now back in California. Talk TV Royal Editor Sarah Houston has told us what happens next will be hugely significant. Whether that meeting between Harry and the King means greater communication by telephone, FaceTime, for example, uh, from between California and Sandringham, that would be a, a step in the right direction. It's also about whether there are any leaks of those conversations, because the royal family are really concerned that private conversations that they have had have ended up in the public domain. Protesters who climb over war memorials or try to hide their identity could face jail under government plans to change the law. Police in England and Wales will be given powers to arrest protesters who cover their face in a bid to avoid prosecution, while people who scale national monuments could face a three-month prison sentence and a £1,000 fine as part of the proposals. But campaigners are calling the new measures a threat to everybody's right to protest. And former senior police officer Victor Elisa has told Talk Today people who want to protest should be able to do so safely. There is a fine line between illegality and disrespect, but what that then does is actually the majority of people who want to protest, the point they're trying to make is lost because a small minority is actually creating disruption which detracts from the legitimate protest. And I think that's important. You know, we're in a democracy. If people want to protest, they want to do so 
peacefully, then they should have the right to be able to do so, and the police should be able to actually make sure they can do so. The prime suspect in Madeleine McCann's disappearance is expected to say largely silent at an upcoming trial in Germany over unrelated sexual offences. Christian Bruckner's lawyer said his client, who's already serving a jail sentence for rape, denies any involvement in the five new offences he's accused of in Portugal. Mr Bruckner has never been charged with Madeleine McCann's disappearance and denies any involvement. And a new study suggests men who take drugs like Viagra for erectile dysfunction may be reducing their odds of developing Alzheimer's disease. A study found that men who took drugs to combat the issue were 18% less likely to develop it than those who did not. The charity Alzheimer's Research UK says the findings are encouraging but called for larger studies to confirm the results. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour. Emily, there's an unexpected you. connection, isn't there? <laughs> well, let's see what the research. Uh, wow. The research comes up for it. We've got loads to talk about this morning, <laughs> we haven't we? Do. Not least your 30 kilometre practice run yesterday for the Paris Marathon. I Rosie ran 30k no, no, after the confession. It was 28. It was 20. In the that's, end. Look, that's still a lot. And I'm so sorry, it's too early for this. I, I've got my first ever blood blister. Well, if you will do this to yourself, it's, it really is revolting. I went home and ate cake, literally. Because it was, <laughs> right, yesterday it was. It's Nick's birthday. This is my new birthday did he shirt. Utter, did he utter a word to anyone? No, no. I didn't. No, it's no, not so that important. We found out at the end. Oh, I probably would it's have not, said. It's not that much of an achievement. Running 28 k's <laughs> in one day after doing a breakfast show is. We have lots of chewy stories to talk about this morning, particularly, uh, as you heard in the news, whether or not the police do deserve more powers to arrest protesters. Uh, we've been asking you whether or not they should get them. Tina says there are protesters and then there are disruptors. It's a big difference. Anyone being disruptive, violent or causing damage should feel the full force of the law. And we're also asking whether or not the Prime Minister should apologise for what is being alleged as a trans jibe made in Prime Minister's questions yesterday. Ryland has said, I hope people are not going to use this terrible tragedy just to force the Prime Minister to apologise to them. Well, that's our top story today. The calls for the Prime Minister to say sorry after making what some are describing a trans jibe in Parliament. And the, the issue specifically is that he made that that joke or that comment uh, while the mother of the murdered, mur murdered teenager, Brianna Jai, had been visiting. Yes, it's all caused a bit of a stir, especially as uh, the Prime Minister and Sir Keir Starmer had only been paying tribute to the victim in the chamber moments earlier. Have a listen to this. Mr Speaker, this week the unwavering bravery of Brianna Jai's mother, mm. Esther, has touched us all. As a father, I can't even imagine the pain that she's going through, and I'm glad that she's with us in the gallery here today. But it's a bit rich, Mr Speaker, to hear about promises from someone who's broken every single promise he was elected on. I mean, I think I counted almost 30 in the last year. Pensions, planning, peerages, public sector pay, tuition fees, childcare, second referendums, defining a woman. Although, although, in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. Of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, shame. In the studio with us, political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald and former advisor to Tony Blair, John McTurnan. John, I've got to start with you because uh, people, some people may say that Keir Starmer was being a bit performative and sort of pretending the degree of outrage that he had. He utterly wasn't. He was furious. You saw him. He was silent. He was shaking and he couldn't believe it. And afterwards, I know, he was vituperative about Sunak, Sunak's behaviour. Um, because what Rishi Sunak did was utterly disgraceful. Why? Because he, he was making a jibe around trans issues. He was making what, a jibe at Keir Starmer. No, he was making a jibe about trans issues. His backbench... No, he was literally his, making a jibe at Keir back, Starmer's his back, inability to define no, no, what no, a woman no. his is. Back, his backbenchers were behind him mm -hmm. laughing. Yeah. It was a jibe... At on, Keir using, Starmer. You did... Anybody... Inability with, to define what no, a woman any, is. No, That's the any, jibe. No, anybody with any... So he was deliberately having a go at Brianna Jai, do you think? Anybody. Was he? He, he was having a jibe at trans rights... He no, he was having a jibe but no, Keir Starmer's inability to define what a woman is. This is uh, it's utterly ridiculous. And we know from, we, we know from Sunak's unwillingness, mm -hmm. inability, to decide whether to apologise or not. He was, they were discussing in number 10, should he apologise? And Kemi Badenoch went, oh, I'm going to send some tweets out. And the PM and his people say that he was bounced into not apologising, not being able to consider apologising because he's minister 
put some tweets out. They're using that issue. Somebody was in the chamber. Sunak tried the line. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't realize. I didn't realize Brianna's mum was there. They are so aware that you should not make jokes up in front of a mother who lost her child. That's why, that's why Keir was so angry, because he couldn't believe the crassness of it. It is crass. And when you do something crass and stupid, you have to say sorry. What they've done is triple down. And I think that's what people can see in the papers. That's what people can see. How can you have no empathy for a mother who lost her child? I, I disagree that that was the issue. I don't think he was having a go at Brianna Jai. Alicia, Labour are making a good amount of political capital out of this. Are they right to do so? Well, this is it. So the issue is less about who it was aimed at and what the joke was and whether it was a joke. It's about the timing of it. And that's what Sunak is facing the brunt of today. It's about potentially a lack of self-awareness. You know, did he really read the room correctly when making this jibe, whether it was a jibe at Keir Starmer, which it probably was, he clearly didn't intentionally say this in front of Brianna Jai's mother, and he's come forward and said he didn't realise that she was in the gallery, he wasn't thinking. You know, that's what lots of people who are supporting him are saying. But the question here really is just about the timing of it. Was it appropriate to say at that given time, could he have left it to another date? And this is in a week for the Prime Minister where he's come under quite a lot of criticism as maybe not being very good at the politics side of the PR side of the job because he'd had that bet that he took with uh, Piers Morgan where some people are saying, you know, the more prime ministerial thing would have been to say, look, this is something too serious for me to gamble on. And now this, you know, for the Conservatives, is this a problem that the prime minister maybe doesn't read the room right? Well, this is it, because he faced so much criticism after that bet, because his defence to taking that bet was, oh, I didn't see it coming, it caught me by surprise. And people are saying that's not really the best defence as a prime minister, that you, you just agree to things because they take you by surprise. People are maybe questioning whether Sunak has the ability to, to judge situations appropriately mm. and maybe think about the bigger picture and the backlash. Because obviously what we saw with this, with this comment that he made yesterday is that now, so many, because he hasn't <coughs> come forward and apologised, it just makes people think that maybe he isn't just aware of the impact of decisions he makes. And I think that is where the issue really is. On this issue that he brought up in Prime Minister's mm. questions yesterday, John, the Prime Minister is consistent. He's made that criticism of Keir Starmer beforehand. So it may have been a bit insincere if then, yes, Yesterday, he said, well, I'm, I'm not going to say things because I'm worried about how they'd be perceived when he know, we know he believes those things. Well, you've hit on something that's really important there, which is I think he, he lacks empathy. Um, so you can say... Um, Do you need you empathy should, to be able to run the country? You definitely need empathy because you're running it on behalf of people, families, communities, businesses, if you don't understand how they feel and how they respond to things. It's like, who's got £1,000 to put a bet on? I mean, well, some... both Rishi Sunak well, and Well, I know, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it, shows, it shows you're different from the public. You're... But the oh, public cool. knows you can be, you that the Prime Minister has yeah. significant wealth. That, that, it would be worse to try and make a secret of that, wouldn't it? No, it's kind of, again, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of crass and insensitive. Cost of living crisis, mm. but I was like, oh, yeah, I can, I can easily wager £1,000 on sending people cruelly abroad. It's something, it's something about the way that he doesn't connect with the public. All Prime Ministers who are successful have a way of talking to voters. Uh, Boris had his way, David Cameron had his way, Tony and Mark. If Boris Thatcher, also had taken the bet, it wouldn't have caused the storm, but, would but, it? But, but that, is, that is true. It's with it, it's, it, but it's, a, it's like his character. He's a playful character. He's still a playful character. Rishi is meant to be the technocrat, making the hard decisions, the right decisions. And then, if I'm making the right decisions, the hard decisions, I'm looking at the spreadsheets, I'm doing... Uh, you're not meant to be surprised. Mm. That's the the thing is, mm. the worst I, I, thing is to be is to have the dissonance between how you act and how I you. I take your point. Is. I mean, I don't want my leaders to have empathy. I want them to be able to do their job properly. But I, I understand that there's a, there's an argument to be had about that. Mm. Can we move on to the uh, other story that is is really interesting this mm. morning? These uh, plans by the Home Secretary to uh, give police new powers over the right to protest. Uh, Alicia, could you possibly just take us through what James Cleverly is suggesting? Absolutely. So the suggestions from the Home Secretary are that protesters, well, police will have the power to arrest protesters if they climb on monuments or statues during protests. 
and also some questions about those wearing face coverings as well and, and the legalities of that because clearly it makes it really hard to identify people if they are doing things uh, wrong um, for the police if they are if they do have their faces fully covered. Clearly though it's quite a difficult thing to implement firstly because obviously in, in law we are allowed to protest, we have freedom to protest so adding these rules will clearly cause some backlash for some protesters who claim it is maybe an infringement on their democratic right to protest. And also it then begs the issue with the face coverings of religion as well, because we know that there are some religions that require mm. you to wear face mm. coverings. So how do you tread that line? And that's what James Cleverley will definitely be questioned mm. on when he when he floats these announcements. Yeah, he's going to make the announcements of these new policies today. We're expecting, John, Labour to back the proposals. Yeah, because Labour at the moment are in a situation where they're trying to narrow the difference between them uh, and, and the government, but they're also trying not to pick a fight on issues they don't want to fight on. We want to fight on the NHS, on the cost of living, on the issues that are day-to-day -day gripes and grumbles. I personally uh, think it's a crazy piece of over-policing. Uh, the cops have got lots of powers and they're bound to misuse it. Yeah. Is it going to be like hoodies? Because uh, a hoodie covers your, covers your identity. So Is there a danger agency? then that this law goes through because Labour don't want to contest it and the police get the ability to, to, to overreach their powers again? The, the Labour's only got 200 votes in the House of Commons. The Tories can do what they want with a majority of, a working majority of 60 at the moment. You know, we're, we're the opposition and we're a very, very weak opposition. So the government should take full responsibility for what they do. And this kind of heavy handed policing, climbing, climbing on statues, is uh, it going to be. Does the law exist already to be, stop that? Uh, well, I'm pretty sure that the police have enough laws to, to arrest people. What is now is more and more about should you have the freedom to have a different opinion from the government? And I, if I was a Conservative, I'd be worried. All these powers are being brought in by a Tory government who think they know how to use the powers. When there's a Labour government, Labour is going to have all of these powers, all of these powers in, under legislation, and they've got... I, I well, do the think police are going to have I these powers, which is what... The, concerns a lot of people. The Conservatives are very clear that they want this crackdown on mm. protests. I think particularly that's what we've seen with mm. some of the demonstrations, the pro-Palestinian uh, demonstrations that have become highly politicised. What, what are the Conservatives trying to achieve, do you think? It's about the third set of measures to say we're clamping down on protest. Definitely. I think that the point of view in government is very much that these protests have crossed a line. So lots of people in government, including the very senior figures, including James Cleverley, all say that it, <coughs> these protesters are totally within their rights to protest. But what crosses the line is when the level of disruption caused. You're allowed to cause disruption, but you shouldn't be disrespectful. And that is the thing that they are having an issue with. When does disrespect become too far and how do you really define what that is it's a really difficult thing to get right it's fascinating you know the right to free assembly is an essential part of a democracy but yeah i appreciate victor elisa's argument that people who do attention seeking stunts which detract from the meaning of a, of a protest can can sometimes be counterproductive but i think it's a british right to be rude and i think there's danger it's danger to say you can't be rude I couldn't agree more, but British we're very right. politely <laughs> <laughs> going to say thank you to Alicia and former Labour advisor John McTinn. And let's take another look at some of the morning's front pages. And now, The Times believes that an alleged Russian spy infiltrated Britain, gaining access to MI6, the Foreign Office, and even managed to secure a meeting with the future King Charles. Shame on you, says the Mirror, as the Prime Minister is accused of being tone deaf, making a trans joke, whilst the mother of murdered trans teen, Brianna Jai, visited Parliament. The Sun go with Top Sun as Prince William poses with the Hollywood actor Tom Cruise at a charity fundraiser last night. That was uh, his first public engagement since his father's cancer diagnosis. Now, it's just gone uh, quarter past seven. Let's turn our attention to the conflict in the Middle East now. The Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has rejected a truce proposal by Hamas. Well, they'd pitched a four-and-a-half-month ceasefire in Gaza, which would see all the hostages freed and an agreement on how to end the war reached. But Netanyahu said only total victory would suffice for Israel, even if it took months. So far, more than 27,000 Palestinians have been reported to be killed and more than 2 million displaced. 136 Israeli hostages are still being held by the terror group Hamas. Well, we're joined by the Israeli hostage negotiator, Gashon Baskin. Thank you so much. Um, what did you make of the offer that was put on the table by Hamas? The main problem the offer put on by Hamas is a surrender by Israel to Hamas and an acknowledgement that Hamas will continue to control Gaza after the war is over. And this is a non-starter for Israel. There is, I can say, a little bit of a crack in the door open 
for negotiations, and it's reported that there is a Hamas team going to Cairo today to meet with the head of central intelligence in Cairo to see if there is some room for negotiation. This agreement uh, proposed by Hamas is in three stages uh, over a, a four-month period of time, and if it is possible to at least agree on the first stage, we might be able to get some of the hostages home, the civilian hostages, in exchange for a 45-day ceasefire and the release of a significant number of Palestinian prisoners. This might be doable. I don't see how they move to stage two and three, which would be an Israeli withdrawal from Gaza and an end to the war while Hamas is still in control of Gaza. This is an impossible situation, yet hostage negotiators like yourself have to pull a result out of that impossibility. Just give us a sense of what is going on behind the scenes in situations like this. How much contact is there? How much negotiation is happening? And how does that impact on what is being said publicly by both sides? Because the hostages are at the absolute centre of all this, aren't they? they? They certainly are. This is a very strange negotiation because you have two sides, Israel and Hamas, who don't talk to each other, who are both dedicated to destroying each other, to killing each other. Israel's goal now is to find the Hamas leadership in Gaza and to kill them. And the Hamas's leadership desire is to kill all the Israelis and all the Israeli leaders. It's not like a normal negotiation where you're sitting in two rooms, you're sitting across from the same table, you reach an agreement, you shake hands, and you leave together. Here, the intent is that the other side won't exist when you finish your negotiation. So it makes it very difficult. There are two mediators here, the Qataris and the Egyptians. They both have their own motivations and interest. They both have leverage on Hamas and limited leverage on Israel. And the United States is also deeply engaged. And the United States is frustrated by the inability to exert more pressure on the Qataris, on the Egyptians, on the Israelis, and on Hamas. And in the meantime, the hostage families are suffering because we know that at least 20% of the hostages are already dead and numbers that are not official are talking more about 50 of the, the 136 hostages no, no longer being alive. And every day they're in Gaza is definitely a risk to their lives. Do you think there's any deal that Hamas could put forward that Netanyahu would say, OK? I think that if it didn't require an Israeli surrender and a recognition that Hamas will stay in power in Gaza, then we could find a, a road, a path to agreement that would release Palestinian prisoners and hostages and have a ceasefire, which both sides badly need. Uh, there is a possibility, and I hope that the mediators find the way to do that, because there are interests on both sides for a timeout. And if we can have this time out without linking it directly to the necessary end of the war, then perhaps uh, uh, we can take a breather, we can get some people free, people in Gaza can get some housing and medical supplies and food and water. It, it would be good for everyone all around if we did manage to have this time out and it was part of a larger deal that we could continue to negotiate. Although both sides want the destruction of each other, everyone also wants the killing to stop. The United States has made uh, noises about this consistently for a number of weeks now, and they were involved in trying to broker this peace deal. How frustrated will they be by Benjamin Netanyahu's just refusal to countenance it? Well, I think we see a, a growing divide between the Biden administration and Mr. Netanyahu. Uh, Secretary of State Blinken was here. He had requested to have a private meeting with the Israeli military chief of staff, which is very unusual that a secretary of state would want to meet with the, the chief of the Israeli military. But I presume that he wanted that because he didn't want Netanyahu in the room. He wants to hear a real honest assessment of where Israel is in the war and where the plans are without the politics behind it. Netanyahu prohibited that meeting from taking place. And uh, Secretary of State Biden met with the Israeli military people in the presence of Prime Minister Netanyahu, who controlled that meeting. We hear the Americans talking more and more about the two-state solution and the need to make progress on the day after political scenarios, which Netanyahu is refusing to do. And here we need to hear the voices coming much stronger from the UK as well. In Foreign Secretary Cameron did speak about the possibility of UK recognition of the state of Palestine. Let's face it, if we wanted to defeat the ideology of Hamas, we need to help Palestinians learn 
that they can live for Palestine and they can stop dying for Palestine. Palestine needs to become real. And the UK, which has historic responsibility in this region, really does need to step forward and recognize the state of Palestine and push for Palestinian state admittance as a member state of the United Nations. That would pave the road forward toward defeating the ideology of Hamas. Fascinating to talk to you, uh, Gershon. Thank you very much. That's Gershon Baskin, a hostage negotiator. 22 minutes past seven. Still to come on Talk Today, Rishi Sunak is told to get more people back to work, stop relying on immigration, and could Viagra lessen the risk of Alzheimer's? Here to discuss those stories, the writer Emma Wolfe and the journalist James Bloodworth are back to have a look through this morning's papers. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet? Multiple of... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat. Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword and a, sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Where are we going on this show? It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> what? Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the new conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka Joe flavoured vape, <laughs> I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. It's 26 minutes past seven. We'll have the weather in just a moment. But here is what else is coming up in the programme. The plot thickens on the scandal facing Baroness Michelle Moan over those government PPE contracts. We'll look at that story in the papers next. Just before nine, we'll be asking if it's right that controversial American journalist Tucker Carlson is interviewing the hostile world, world leader Vladimir Putin. And just after nine o'clock, the backlash against Rishi Sunak intensifies. We'll be asking a trans campaigner if the Prime Minister should apologise for his joke while the mother of murdered teenager Brianna Jai was able to listen. First, let's take a look at the weather, and there is lots of it around this week. Joe, what's happening right now? It certainly is pretty busy with the weather today. It's transition day as an area of low pressure moves in, which is going to keep things unsettled into the weekend. But it's this uh, milder air meeting up with the current cold air across the country, which is likely to cause some problems. Let's take a look. <laughs> Oh. 
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, well, we've got temperatures down to minus 12 Celsius over parts of Scotland this morning, whereas down to the south, plus 12. And it's this area of low pressure which is making its way in. It's going to bring some unsettled conditions. And as the rain meets up with the very cold air, we're likely to see some sleet or snow. Indeed, this is already showing up on the radar in some parts of the country where we've got an amber warning. Could see up to 25 centimetres of snow and that's alongside some very strong winds as well. So those amber warnings mostly for the high ground of Wales, also for parts of the Peak Districts and the Pennines. Uh, we've got yellow warnings for rain down in the south, snow and ice through central areas and indeed over Scotland as well. Some wintry weather there. This is where we've got the very low temperatures to start the day. We'll see a few wintry showers here and later on the snow will reach those areas too. And then further south, we start to see those milder conditions coming in. So that uh, rain coming up from the south pushes its way northwards. We see a second area of rain pushing in later in the day. Those are the temperatures for today, around three or four degrees Celsius for most. But down in the south, we could see uh, double figures for many and perhaps even a 13 or a 14 in the southwest. So the mild air continues to push its way northwards as we go through this evening and overnight. The cold air stays over Scotland. And again, where the rain runs into that cold air, we'll find some sleet and snow at times. Those warnings remain right the way through until tomorrow morning. So that's the way things look overnight. Still cold in the north and obviously we've got that easterly wind to go with it as well, but really quite mild down towards the south. And then through the course of tomorrow, as we go in towards the weekend, warnings out for parts of Scotland. And again, we've got some snow and ice there. That snow most likely to be heaviest out towards the east. Aberdeen shall likely to be affected. For northeastern parts of England, more likely to be as rain, or at least turning back to rain through the course of the day. And then further south, it's a much milder picture. Temperatures in double figures, but uh, a little bit of sunshine around, variable amounts of cloud, and also some showers that will merge together into some longer spells of rain at times. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Joe, thank you. In the studio with us again, Emma Wolfe and the journalist James Bloodworth for another look at this morning's papers. Morning to you both. Morning. Um, Emma, let's start on this story that's in the Times and many of the papers this morning about yeah. the Home Secretary's uh, new policies that are going to be announced a little bit later today on a further crackdown on protesters. Yeah, this is the third uh, crackdown on these protests in recent years. Um, this is very much in response to the pro-Palestinian pro protests that we've seen over recent months. And the Met Police have been saying they don't have sufficient powers to crack down. People have, lots of people have expressed outrage at the kind of, at, at some of the protests, a limited number. Um, and this is, um, so, so James Cleverley is going to be announcing that uh, people who wear, uh, who conceal their faces to commit criminal damage, um, people uh, that, that they might face up to a month in jail. Um, they're going to be making flares and fireworks illegal. Um, and they're really cracking down on people who sort of use the face covering thing, who use those, you know, violent um, flares and fireworks. Um, to to cause to cause trouble on the streets, to cause it sort of inflict intimidation on other people. There's going to uh, they're going to be made illegal. Also, a maximum fine of a thousand pounds. So yeah, it's it's a response to the protest, but also just the Met Police saying actually we need greater powers. Uh, I just wonder whether or not there aren't laws to combat this already, James. I mean, climbing on monuments is disrespectful. I understand that. Whether that should be criminalised could be a moot point. But if you're creating damage or if you're being a public nuisance, then there are laws against that anyway, aren't there? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the, the clue is kind of in the name, criminal damage. I, I don't think it should really matter whether, whether someone's wearing a face mask or not. I think the public would hope that criminal damage, whether it was on a protest, whether anywhere else, is prosecuted. I don't really see why that needs a new law. It's the same with some of the... So some of the recent protests, there were complaints that the, the, by the Met that they didn't have enough powers to arrest people uh, for certain, say, placards or certain chants. I mean, there are already quite stringent hate, hate speech laws in this country. Um, some people would say that they impinge on free speech too much. Um, I think those laws already exist. I think the Met is always asking for more powers. Yes. And I it's think like the military always asking for more troops and weapons. And it's also, I think... We should be suspicious of that. I, yeah, and I think it's also a, a real sense of how the police have applied their existing powers and what the, 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 the discretion that they have used in terms of who and who they haven't cracked down on. And it's really difficult. I mean, as James raises, they have these powers, but... Things like chants, certain chants that might be offensive, you know, from the river to the sea, that kind of thing. How do you interpret that? And the Met Police have in recent months said things like, well, we have a team who understand these things, or, or, or the interpretation of the word jihad, for example. You know, has that been seen as 
is that is that acceptable holy war or is it an offensive mm. term is it so it's, it's very much about interpretation these are gray areas and, and also the wearing of face masks or face coverings can be done for a variety of reasons mainly some people just don't want to be <laughs> identified Mostly dodgy well, yeah, it's, yeah well is it dodgy though because the police used to make a habit of, of videotaping people getting their identities logged, building databases on them, and many of these people were just exercising their right to free protest. So, of course, yeah. people started covering their faces. Now, the problem becomes when you've got someone committing a criminal offence who's got a face covered, it becomes yeah. harder to go after them and I identify them. But whether or not you need to legislate to force people to remove face coverings, again, I, I, I don't know where you... It's very where, where do you stand on this, then? I think it's... Well, I, I mean, I find, I find it threatening when I see people yes, with it, their faces it's covered. it's incredibly intimate. But that's only my, my view. I find it threatening. I also think it's blurred further by the fact that lots of people have started wearing face masks anyway. So we've had this new thing of covering your face mm. a bit more than we used to have. Oh, my in son this country. loves wearing his snood up to his eyes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you have guys with yeah, their hoodies yeah, on. Absolutely. But you also have religious people who wear sorry, religious people. Um, you, you have you have cultures who wear who wear um, face coverings. You also have the whole issue of burqas and things. And I was talking to a security expert who was talking about the Clapham attacker, the acid attack, who said he could just put on a burqa which is awful and true and, and, and alarming to think of people going around fully covered up who we think we're on a manhunt for. So it's a really complicated issue, mm. isn't it? So it depends what they're doing, doesn't it? I mean, if someone's committing criminal damage, then they're already cr committing the offence and they become a problem and they mm. can already be asked to remove their, their, their garment or, or whatever if they're doing that. I mean... I, I, I think, does that need, do we need new laws specifically about that? Uh, well, I'm slightly concerned that this law might Probably be being not. introduced for political reasons because uh, they want to create a dividing line with Labour. Labour don't want to create this dividing line, so the law goes through simply for, for, for no apparent reason other well, than to... we're going to be hearing from some of the police we are. perspective we a are. later on the programme. So let's move on. Um, James, The Telegraph. My, the headline is, Migration won't save the UK from its debt crisis. Who's making that, or that argument? So David Miles, who's an executive member of the Office of Budget Responsibility, which um, basically gives recommendations to the government. Um, it's supposed to be independent, gives recommendations on the economy. Uh, he's saying that, you know, migration won't save the UK from a debt crisis um, and that there are too many people uh, claiming, claiming some form of benefit and it's, it's basically costing the Treasury lots of money. Um, I mean, this goes into uh, Britain's... Got a big benefit bill. I mean, almost three million of people on long-term benefits. It's sickness benefit. Um, Britain's the most obese nation in Europe and one of the unhealthiest nations in Europe. And COVID's made that a lot uh, worse. So you have a lot more people now with uh, long COVID who are receiving benefits. Um, we really need to kind of tackle the. Once you get down into this, into what this is talking about, it's Britain really needs to get some of these people who are off, who are on long-term sickness benefit off of it and we need to become basically that's a huge problem if it was easy it would have been you know the conservatives in 13 years would have done that it's a very difficult pro difficult challenge we need to become healthier as a nation well, um, one of the things that always basically. comes up any of those people off long-term sick often say, well, part of that is because I can't get an appointment properly, I can't get treatment. The waiting list is so long. All these problems... It's such a chicken and egg. Each it's yeah. such a chicken and egg yeah. thing. And I was thinking, just as you so were saying that, even being on long-term benefits, even being long-term unemployed, feeds into mental health issues, yeah. depression, anxiety, Losing loneliness, all of that. Because you're not... Back into the of course it's harder to yeah. get back in if you haven't worked for years. And we did and create some of this by putting people on furlough for basically the country not working for a couple of years during COVID. Um, and then, as you say, if people can't get proper treatment, someone with a, with a you know, an agonising back pain, how are they meant to work when they can't get treatment? How are they meant to be up on their feet all day working in, a, you know, in, a, in an active job? So it's a really, really tricky one. Um, and, yet, and, and, and any government who cracks down on benefits in that way is seen as cruel and mean and throwing people off disability benefit when they need to be seen and all of that. So it's... It's yeah, a you, really tricky. You've got one. an issue with the tax rates as well. So you've got the personal allowance, tax-free personal allowance, isn't so effective anymore because the inflation and whatnot has, has eroded it over recent years. Yeah. Mm. Um, shall we move on to another story that you've got, James? This is on the front page of the Guardian, and it, it looks pretty damning for Baroness Michelle Main. Yeah. So I mean, she's is is um, conservative peer Michelle Main. She assured the government she was not entitled to any financial benefit whatsoever from the PPE. Uh, company and then five months later, uh, 29 million of its profits were transferred into a trust for her benefit. Um, yeah, I mean this this is of 
very sordid story, and it's made worse by the fact that this is somebody who sits in the House of Lords and is a live peer. And also and deny doing anything wrong and threaten journalists with legal action if they printed stories about her. Yeah, I mean, lie to journalists. I mean, she, she, she you know, said she didn't lie to politicians but lie to journalists as if that's somehow... Um, OK. So this is a step further, because it does suggest she was telling a porky pie to the government, if it's true. Yeah, yeah, no, if, if it's true. And, the, you know, her, she's, she's also said that her, her husband... You know, they were motivated, really, by wanting a desire to help the NHS, and, you know, uh, her husband, Doug, is a very philanthropic individual. This is um, a chap who's, um, you know, in trouble in Spain as well over various financial dodgy dealings, yes. which I think we discussed last week. Oh, this goes yeah. from grubby. I mean, we had her car crash interview, which kind of put her up there with Prince Andrew in car crash interviews. But this just goes from... And, and also the sense that she was already a bra tycoon. We know that she had millions of pounds anyway. She was very, very Rich wealthy people woman. people always seem to want more, don't this they? Was, I know, well, they do. <laughs> but, but, I mean, this wasn't a, a start-up business trying to do well out of PPE, trying to make a lot of money out of PPE. This was a very wealthy woman yeah. making more millions out of PPE. So I think it's extra grubby in some it, ways. Yeah, and it brings, it brings kind of the upper chamber into disrepute to have really people like does. that in there. And in raises that conversation again, again, the political conversation about the, the Lords. Can we quickly talk about, please, uh, yes. a bit more of a positive story. Fantastic a very photo. grinning Tom Cruise oh, on the front page of many yeah. of the papers. Absolutely oh, I think superb. The Sun have gone with Top Sun. Top Sun. Um, apparently, well, they're Tom both... Tom Cruise looks like Bob Monkhouse um, in this. Each other's wingman. wingman. Well, yeah, um, Tom, um, Prince William, who I think's really come into his own in the last few me weeks and months, but especially at the moment, he's the kind of hero, you know, you know, he's going to the crown fits. ride to save us all and he's going to be the royal family for everybody at the moment. But he's brilliant. He's obviously going through a heck of a lot. And he called Tom Cruise his fellow pilot and he made a little joke with him at this... It was a fundraiser. It was a charity due for the London Air Ambulance last night in London. And um, there's Prince William and Tom Cruise Channeling grinning away together in their... 70s comedian. Don't you think he looks like a game tie. show host? They ah, do. They yes. both look a bit... Well, I think <laughs> black tie anyway with bow ties is a bit... Game show the grin as well. Yeah. But um, this is Will's yeah. first kind of public statement since the, um, Charles's cancer diagnosis and since Kate's abdominal um, surgery. Um, and, yeah, William's grinning away there. They're raising money for the London Air Ambulance. And he says to Tom Cruise, please don't steal our helicopters. And, you know, it makes lots of kind of Mission Impossible jokes and jollies. And the I think it's a, lighter, well. it's a lighter note yeah. given the sort of tension and the unpleasantness and the sadness over the Harry visit and Charles' diagnosis. And I think, tr truthfully, needed. Um, James, Emma, thank you both so much. And they'll be back in about an hour's time to go through some more uh, stories that they've found for you. Lots of you getting in touch. And we started the show with this, and it's not going to go away today politically. The big question that the Prime Minister is going to be asked again and again is, why haven't you apologised to the family of Priyana Jai? After saying what he said at Prime Minister's Questions yesterday, JD has texted in to say, what a bizarre world we live in today. Show someone this even 10 years ago and they wouldn't believe it. Show them it in 10 years' time and I doubt they'd believe it either. Uh, Simon says, I don't expect an apology from the Prime Minister. The Tories have always been successful in lacking manners, ethics and a basic understanding of civilised society. Louisa says, the poor mother came into Parliament to campaign for the ban on social media for under-16s. It's a shame that our politicians use their cheap political tactics at a time when she's grieving the horrendous murder of her trans child. It's, it's really, really controversial. The subject matter is really thorny. And then maybe just the Prime Minister's behaviour. That's a couple of times this week he's done something that maybe some would say uh, maybe it wasn't the wisest move. Have your say. There'll be much more to come on this. You can email us, talktoday at talk.tv. But right now, let's move on, because the Met Office has issued two amber weather warnings with snow and ice expected to cover at large parts of North Wales, parts of Shropshire and the Pennines today. Our reporter Nick Ellaby is live from North Wales, where one of those warnings is in place. Good morning, Nick. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, my Nick, goodness. You know, you know I'll go anywhere for you guys. <laughs> Look, actually, a bit of good fortune. We've just seen a gritter go past. So that amber warning, I'm, I'm, I'm just north of a place called Clangochlan. In a, it's a stunning part of the country, but I can't see anything at the moment because I've got a gale blowing into my face. The sun is supposed to come up about now, but it's very misty up here. We had a lot of rain here overnight, but it's currently snowing pretty hard. It's a bit of a mixture of, of sleet as well. But uh, as you say, we've come up into that amber warning in North Wales for you, which starts at eight o'clock this morning and runs through till this afternoon. That means Disruption to transport is very, very likely. Local communities could get cut off. We could see power cuts. We might hamper our own investigations because we've driven a few kilometres up into the hills for you. We're just in the sort of Clawidian range. There's some gorgeous hills 
over to my right, which Tony can show you. But currently the, the snow's coming down quite quickly and, and starting to settle. Certainly North Wales is braced for a lot of snow today. There are, I think every school in Flintshire in that northeast part just south of Liverpool is closed today. At least eight schools in Gwynedd are closed as well. And I know one high school in Wrexham is, is shut for the day. So they're expecting a lot of snow here. And, and also in the Peak District in the Southern Pennines is that other amber warning, which is much more dangerous than the yellow warning. That's, that comes into force from midday. And then the whole of the north of England, North Wales, is covered by a yellow warning for snow. Southern Scotland and Northern Scotland today is going to get snow and ice. There are yellow warnings up there. And then in the south of England, there's a yellow warning for rain later on. So a lot of stuff coming out of the sky and a lot of people hunkering down here in North Wales. But some people are out enjoying themselves. This is Chris Morris. Hello. He's a, a Welsh skier. He's from Pembrokeshire. Chris, what are you doing here? I'm here for a ski. Have you ever skied up here before? I haven't skied here before, but it's the first time for everything. And you were telling me, you know, you can see up here how quickly the snow can actually settle. So about an hour ago, there wasn't much snow. Are you expecting to be able to actually get on these slopes this morning? Oh, within an hour, I'll be on the slope. All right, so we're, we're going to see if we can get some shots of live shots of Chris actually skiing up here for the first time for you. And uh, maybe we'll come back to you in an hour or so and uh, see if we can get some actually get some sunlight for you guys. Can I, Nick, can I ask Chris, how's he going to get... Obviously, there's no chairlifts. Is he going to be walking up to then ski yeah. down and then drive up? What's the plan? Well, he's driven up here this far. We're just at the Ponderosa Cafe, a lovely viewpoint on the Horseshoe Pass. Chris, how are you going to get up to the top of the hills and down again? We're going to hike and then we're going to ski down. Right. <laughs> Have you got friends coming up as well? Uh, hopefully, yeah, if they can get up. So. So if, if the roads don't get snowed under, he's got a few more mates as well coming to sn ski and snowboard with him. So hike up, ski down, and maybe hike up again. And then repeat. It will be absolutely exhausting, I'm sure. Uh, Nick, thank you so much. Chris, we'll check in with you a little bit later to see how that skiing gets on. It sounds like in Wales there's quite a lot of children on snow days today. Yeah, I mean, I can watch TV news reporters struggling against the elements for <laughs> hours. I want to see more of Nick Ellaby back on the show as soon as possible. And if Great you've got a pictures. snow day, um, well, you can stay with us for a little bit longer because yeah, we're till half past nine. Tell us if you're going skiing. Why not? Um, still to come here on the show, away from the snow, Sam Ellard is here with all sports. Yeah, thank you, Rosie. Chelsea beat Aston Villa to ease the pressure on Maurizio Pochettino and also three members of Boyzone. They're the latest celebrities to enter the beautiful game, joining forces to buy part of non-league club Chorley. All of that and so much more. This is Talk Today. A very good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it, they don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet... Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Oh, 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 there we go, <laughs> on the show. <laughs> it's carry on, what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, I like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq Khan, <laughs> brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka Joe flavoured vape, 
I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it goes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. It's coming up to 10 minutes to 8. Now, Chelsea managers breathing a bit of a sigh of relief this morning after a 3-1 victory last night against Aston Villa. It comes after weeks of speculation over whether or not he will remain in the role because of the terrible results that Chelsea have been having recently. Talk Sports Sam Ellard is here with all the latest sport. Uh, Sam, so this has obviously put some credit in the bank, but how secure is Pochettino's Not very secure right at all. This will give him a little bit more breathing space. It was a, a big win last night. It was a, an FA Cup fourth round replay game away at Aston Villa who've had a really good season so it was a big victory for him um, it feels like he's a man still on very very thin ice I mean their Premier League form this season has been woeful they've spent pretty much all of the season in the bottom half of the table when you think that Todd Bowley the owner has spent you know around a billion pounds in the last couple of years they clearly should be doing a lot better he's um, not a bad manager though is I, I, so I genuinely think Pochettino is a really really good coach I think he showed at Tottenham over a, a five year period He's a very, very good coach on a limited budget there. He had them playing in the Champions League. He took them to a Champions League final. Um, I personally think that there are so many bigger problems at the moment than the manager. I think the way Todd Bowley's run the football club has been an absolute mess. A lot of the players have come in, wouldn't have been Poch's signings. They're clearly nowhere near good enough. So I really think they should give him time, like, like Spurs did, to build a squad. Because but I think he's a very know, talented coach. Football but, doesn't work like Yeah, that. and also what Todd Bowley's thinking next is, is anyone's guess. I mean, literally, it's like... It's like he's playing football manager on a computer, the way he's running this football club. Um, I mean, there were chance of Jose Mourinho's name at the Premier League game on the weekend. Ooh, I mean, like, really? it would be the most Todd Bowley thing ever. And also, they, they, they've got a cup final coming up in a couple of weeks' time as well, don't they, against Liverpool. Yeah. Um, and obviously, Mourinho is a winner. I don't know, there's just something about Todd Bowley thinking, let's get that Mourinho guy in. But no, the pressure's on, bottom half. But that was, uh, it gives him last night a little bit of respite anyway for the next couple of days. Um, should we talk about Messi? Because earlier in the week, there was a bit of an upset from the fans who spent a huge amount of money expecting to see him on the pitch, but he was out for injury. Yesterday, he was playing. It's fair to say a fairly brief appearance. Yeah, he came on yesterday in the uh, in the 60th minute, uh, back for, for, for into Miami. This was obviously over in Japan, in, in Tokyo. Uh, as you mentioned, it's obviously a, a big money match. A lot of people over there have spent good money to, to go and see him play. Um, he was fit. Not fit enough to start, sadly. He came off the bench. Uh, he played about half an hour yesterday. Uh, the game ended up a new and all draw. The game went to penalties. <laughs> was it? And inside, yeah, new and all draw. But I think the, the scoreline is kind of irrelevant. The game, it was all about, wasn't it, just kind of seeing Lionel Messi on the pitch. Uh, went to penalties. The side did win. Uh, most importantly, uh, a lot of people uh, were very happy to see a, a certain Lionel Messi return yeah. and play football. Those, a few booze as well, which is always good. Those poor people in Hong Kong who paid, what, $365? Well, you might say poor Messi's to... injured. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. We don't know how he did. He managed, to, he managed to come back quite quickly, didn't yeah. he? I don't think that's too expensive, though. By the way, I think you know some of the some of the uh, some someone's of the, doing all no, right. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I should, make, I should make this perfectly clear. <laughs> I would never do that. But some of the stories you hear about tickets going for ten, twenty thousand. That's the point that I'm making, Rosie. Right. Not that I splash out five hundred yeah, pounds left, yeah. right, and centre on the football We're team. We're learning about you all the time because that's when you get into real hot water. I can assure you that I definitely don't do that. Okay. Should we talk about the oval ball? We're in the middle of the Six Nations tournament. Got underway last weekend. I love the Six Nations when it comes around because for me it's the first sign of spring. Yeah. <laughs> the things are changing in the seasons and so it's as regular as the seasons, isn't it? And uh, Warren Gatlin's made seven yeah. Wales changes to face England. I can England. see you in a, in a pub on a Saturday afternoon I, I drinking do love a, bit a Guinness. Of Six you know. I, I know nothing about club rugby but I love it yeah. when the tests come around. Bit of a glory hunter when it comes yeah, to rugby. Exactly. You get, that's, that's absolutely I can live with that. I can yeah, live I that's with absolutely some. perfectly <laughs> acceptable. I mean, last weekend though, you could argue with probably one of the most dramatic opening weekends we've ever had in terms of Italy pushing England really, really close. Then of 
course, the dramatic Wales Scotland game. Wales yeah. leading by 27 points. In the end, it finished 27 26. This weekend, it's England versus Wales, always a one of the more iconic fixtures in the in the Six Nations calendar. And really the big news is that George North is returning from injury to play for Wales at Twickenham, one of seven changes, and is going to be his 50th Six Nations appearance, which is pretty good going. So uh, hopefully going to get an England team. Normally going to get that on the Thursday, which should be today. But George North back for Wales, always a massive game at Twickenham. Right, we'd like to talk about figure skating because there has been a real <laughs> Do you always do that on this show? Drama. It's, it's your okay. pet subject, Sam. This yeah. is... I'm an expert on this. Yeah. Camilla Valieva, this the is... banned yeah. Russian figure skater, has come up with an excuse for why she failed her doping test and it is a, a hair-raising one. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, so for those who don't know, she was given a four-year ban after testing positive for a banned heart medication. This was back in 2021. It's now been revealed... You ready for this, Rosie? Mm -hmm. Have a listen to this. She's claimed, claim being the big word here, that her positive doping test could have been caused, it could have been caused by a strawberry dessert that was prepared by her grandfather on the same chopping board as the banned substance. So essentially, we've got the banned substance on the chopping could board. Be. We've got a strawberry dessert also could on be. the same chopping board. And who knows, maybe could be. it could have been mixed she in she 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 consumes it. I mean, it sounds unlikely. Presto. It sounds unlikely, but it sounds could unlikely. be. But what it has done is joined the litany of drug doping excuses that have gone down in history, which the team uh, at Talk Today here have put together for us. Can I, uh, go, can I go with my favourite one on this list? Can you do your favourite one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My favourite one here is, is, is Richard Gasquet, a very, very famous tennis player. Um, after testing positive for cocaine, Gasquet blamed a waitress he spent a night kissing claiming she was a user and therefore must have accidentally transferred some of the drug into his mouth while they were kissing. Ooh, there was a lot of saliva going up between the two there. Um, my favourite is sprinter LaShawn Merritt, who failed three drug tests for a banned steroid. He claimed it was because he was using a penis enlargement supplement called Extensi. Well, we've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, right? We've exactly. all been there. Yeah, but I, for the I, grace of God. Yeah, I, I, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. Yeah, we've all been there. Rosie, what, what, anyone <laughs> caught your eye here? <laughs> I just... There are always attempts to wriggle out of these uh, bans, but they're, they're largely unsuccessful. Say that again, Rosie, sorry? The, often, you come up with an excuse like that, you don't manage to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, do you? No, no, again, I should make this perfectly clear that the CATS, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, in this case, they did make it very clear there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever <laughs> to suggest that this was true. So, yeah, I mean, it's all a load of absolute nonsense, isn't it? I mean, by the way, here, we've got a list here yeah. of about ten different Well, hang on, hang on. Can, I, can, I give, can I give you Go one on. more? Because I love it to bits. This is the cyclist, uh, Adri van der Poel, and cycling, we know, has already had lots of problems. Um, he apparently was found with strychnine, uh, which is an early performance enhancer in his bloodstream. And he said it came from uh, eating racing pigeons who had been doped with strychnine to fly faster and his uncle had made him a pie with a <laughs> racing pigeon in and that's how he got strychnine in his system. Crazy. A pigeon pie, basically. But, yeah, but, you know, it's absolutely laughing, insane. But that there is very a serious, serious, serious no. problem where athletes are trying to <laughs> cut corners and find other ways to enhance their performance and still yeah. think they can get away with it. And again, you're absolutely spot on. And this is happening way, 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 way too often, certainly in these types of sports. I mean, in particular, not just the Russians, but we know in particular there's been a lot of problems with, with Russian athletes in the, in the past couple of years. Way too many cases, way too many instances. And what a shame, isn't it? Great sports are being ruined by people that are winning medals, by the way, winning big tournaments, mm. big medals, and it's all just not legit. It's all not, it's all not unjust. But, Sam, I mean, she really shouldn't have had that strawberry cake, so should she? Let's just... We have to leave it there. Sam Ella thank you. Thank you, Really Sam. appreciate your time. Lots to come here. We've got a busy hour ahead. New powers for the police against protesters are going to be announced today, but is that infringing on our civil rights? This is Talk Today. It's four minutes to eight. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it.
this concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. A crossbow, a hatchet. Multiple of... crossbows. Multiple crossbows. Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat. Carry on. A crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Whoa, this... It was like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor. Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Nick Wallace and Rosie Wright. Very good morning to you. It's 8 o'clock on Thursday, the 8th of February. Good morning. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. Pressure for an apology. Rishi Sunak is accused of stirring up the trans debate whilst the mother of murdered trans teen Brianna Shea was visiting Parliament. Protests crack down. People who climb on war memorials or try to hide their identity during demonstrations could face jail under new government plans. And William's wingman, the Prince of Wales, teams up with Tom Cruise at a charity fundraiser thanking supporters as he appears in public for the first time since the King's cancer diagnosis. And we'll see some challenging conditions today as rain, sleet and snow push their way northward. All the details coming up shortly. But first, let's get the headlines with Emily. Thanks, Rosie. Good morning. The father of murdered transgender girl Brianna Jai has said the Prime Minister's comments yesterday were absolutely dehumanising. Peter Spooner has joined growing calls for Rishi Sunak to apologise for what's been described as degrading comments in Parliament. Brianna's mother, Esther, was present at Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak said that the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, had U-turned on his definition of a woman. It came shortly after he paid tribute to her murdered daughter. Labour's set to announce it's ditching its major environmental policy to spend £28 billion a year on green investment. It comes amid stark warnings by scientists that global warming exceeded 1.5 degrees Celsius over a year for the first time. They're urging immediate action to curb carbon emissions. The Prince of Wales has thanked the public for their messages of support since his father, the King's shock cancer diagnosis. William was seen undertaking public duties for the first time yesterday since his wife Catherine underwent surgery. He expressed his gratitude at a star-studded charity fundraiser for London's Air Ambulance, which was attended by Hollywood royalty Tom Cruise. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you also for the kind messages of support for Catherine and for my father, especially in recent days. It means a great deal to us all. But William didn't see Prince Harry in his fleeting visit to see his father. The Duke of Sussex is now back in California. 
Two amber warnings for snow and ice come into force this morning in North Wales and North West Shropshire. It's the start of plunging temperatures expected for much of the country going into the weekend with heavy snow and warnings of travel disruption and possible power cuts on the way. Well, the Independence travel correspondent Simon Calders told Talk TV the disruption could be severe. So journeys could take longer, they could be cancelled, and that's going to continue right through till tomorrow. But unfortunately, as you know and I know, problems develop during the day. Um, it's only once the um, uh, snow starts falling in earnest we will know how bad things are. But uh, it is going to affect not just today, tomorrow, all the way through to the evening as well. And Little Sims and Stormzy were among the winners at this year's Mobos last night in Sheffield. Stormzy won Best Music Video at the awards that honour achievements in music of black origin. Central C took home Best Male Act and the singer Ray got Best Female Act. I'll have more headlines at nine o'clock. Thank you, Emily. I went to the Mobos once. I met Chuck D. Oh, and wow. decided that I wanted him to be my dad. OK. He was brilliant. <laughs> that was about 20 years ago. What did he say about that? He was just... Well, I didn't actually put that to him, but I just came away from doing an interview with him and thought, you are a very, very, wow. very nice man. In awe, great. It is. Time to look at our top story this morning here on Talk Today. And there are calls for Rishi Sunak to apologise after making a trans jibe in Parliament whilst the mother of the murdered teenager, Brianna Jai, had been visiting. It's caused a stir. I'm sure it's going to dominate the political conversation today. Well, Keir Starmer had been paying tribute to the victim in the chamber moments before Rishi Sunak uh, made that, as some people are saying, sort of jibe towards Starmer. For, to kind of get the best analysis of what happened, let, let's just watch. Mr Speaker, this week the unwavering bravery of Brianna Jay's mother, mm. Esther, has touched us all. As a father, I can't even imagine the pain that she's going through, and I'm glad that she's with us in the gallery here today. But it's a bit rich, Mr Speaker, to hear about promises from someone who's broken every single promise he was elected on. I mean, I think I counted almost 30 in the last year. Pensions, planning, peerages, public sector pay, tuition fees, childcare, second referendums, defining a woman. Although, although, in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. Of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, shame. We're joined now in the studio by political commentator Benedict Spence. Benedict, this is going to cause such amount of controversy. The Prime Minister has been asked to apologise. From what we're hearing from number 10, he's mm. not going to do that. No, I don't think he is. Um, I think he's actually in some ways right not to. Um, it's simply because whilst making a joke might have been in poor taste, being able to speak freely about the immutable characteristics of sex uh, shouldn't be a controversial topic. And I think actually to use the tragic murder of an individual to try to browbeat people into not discussing it, I think is as in poor taste as joking about it, well, frankly. And I think it, it was such... deeply unstatesmanlike, actually, of Sir Keir Starmer, uh, well, not having consulted the family, to uh, bring to everybody's attention that they were there again and in front of the nation use them to browbeat the Prime Minister. I don't think that's acceptable. Why is it such a controversial topic? Well, transgenderism. Yeah. I, th I mean, that's a really... <laughs> Uh, we could be here for a very long time. Um, I think it's controversial simply because a lot of people feel that it infringes on their immutable rights as women or men, uh, depending on the safety of various spaces and the safety of various things that are allocated to them. I think a lot of women, I don't want to speak for women here, would argue that having gone through very long, very arduous processes over the centuries of getting to a position where they have protected characteristics, protected spaces, where men are not able to simply waltz in and do what they want, for a man to just turn around and go, I am now a woman, and to then be able to access that space, uh, is a transgression. And I also think that a lot of people would argue uh, that gender dysphoria meets all the criteria of a mental condition, and that actually it is being indulged by a lot of people for political reasons or of the reasons of just be appearing to be nice to young people and that it doesn't actually do them very much good to indulge it at a very young and impressionable age. I think there's two things going on here. Mm. There is that debate, that political debate, yeah. but then also there was maybe just poor taste yes. yesterday. And maybe the criticism levelled at the Prime Minister is that there have now been two things this week, mm. him taking the bet from Piers Morgan on this uh, channel in the interview about whether he would be able to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. Mm. Um, and then this, because 
regardless of his views and the debate he's had with Keir Starmer, was it unwise for him to make comments like that, which many will say were insensitive? I think you could certainly argue that it was a silly trap to fall into and that actually whether or not that's a reflection on him and his ability to And he improvise. wasn't really set a trap there. He, he walked into it himself. Well, I'm not saying that Keir Starmer set it for him, but it was a trap, and it's something that perhaps either he or the people briefing him should have seen, oh, by the way, the family are up in the gallery. You might want to avoid joking about this particular topic. That's the sort of thing that actually a prime minister ought to be briefed on, and that a good uh, uh, performer at the dispatch box should be able to navigate, not unlike the, the bet example. I think this shows somebody who is ill-adjusted with the ability to improvise uh, in the short term. That's not necessarily what makes a very good Prime Minister, but I don't think it's great that these seem to be piling up. It's not actually the first time that we've seen him get prickly with interviewers, uh, say the wrong thing. Remember during the debates with Liz Truss, he didn't actually come off particularly well. Um, he almost seemed to be sort of hectoring and lecturing and he wouldn't give her opportunities to talk whilst they were having that leadership contest. It gives the impression of a man who is ill at ease when with dealing with people. Mm. And given that um, and, and uh, the cabinet is collegiate... And can't necessarily think on his feet because that yeah. was a pre-scripted line that he had. He knew mm. uh, that Brianna Jai's mother was in the chamber. Obviously, you don't want to upset or ri run the risk of upsetting mm. a, a grieving mother. Nonetheless, uh, Labour have said that this was a transphobic slur, or at least trans <laughs> activists are calling this a transphobic slur, and they're trying to basically connect the two issues. Well, they would. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. Actually, to point out, again, that uh, matters of sex are based on chromosomal disposition, that you can't change that, um, and that members... Let's be clear, actually, members of both major parties have had issues with this uh, for reasons of popularity in the past. To point out that the Labour Party has more issues than the Conservative Party on it is not unfair, given that I think a lot of people feel very strongly about it. OK, Benedict, stay with us for the moment. Another story that we want to talk about here on Talk Today. Uh, in the headlines, the Home Secretary will be announcing new protest laws that will give police the power to arrest demonstrators using face coverings and will make it an offence to carry pyrotechnics at marches. Well, the new measures will be introduced as part of the Criminal Justice Bill. It also includes a potential three-month prison sentence for climbing on war memorials. But well, also joining us in the studio now is the activist Iman Ailton. Thank you so much um, for being in the studio uh, with us. Um, is this overreach by the police? Oh, well, of course, it's overreached by the government. Let's just be fair. I think they have to get their priorities in order, right? So right now, we seem to be focusing on uh, protests. We seem to be focusing on marches. We seem to be focusing on masks, uh, pyrotechnics. Um, and in reality, there are far more pressing issues at hand. And well, this is the issue. This of those issues, which ones do you have specific problems with? 14 million people in poverty. Uh, no, 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 sorry, people... not the issues. The issues, the, the issues that the government are saying <laughs> they want to legislate. You know, that may be I'm a very... I'm going to give you a list, <laughs> That's fine. We can do a completely oh, side, right. side debate on that. But I just want to just pick apart your thoughts on these specific proposals. Yeah. Which ones do you have a specific problem with and why? OK, so I think the main thing for me, it comes down to... Pyrotechnics, I just think, is a complete waste of time. It's it's kind of a generic thing that is a part of protest. That's an issue for me. Um, of course, it comes down to standing on war memorials. This is a big thing, and I think this is where the contention lies because this has been happening for decades. Why should and you yet, stand all on of a war a sudden, memorial, though? That's disrespectful, isn't it? But there are loads of things that are disrespectful. I personally think what's disrespectful, again, not to go on a tangent, but we have to stick on the topic, what's disrespectful is prioritising protests over homelessness, prioritising protests over the NHS, prioritising protests over poverty. Meanwhile, people are literally ripping out their teeth, ripping out their teeth, their own teeth, because they can't get a dentist appointment. Whilst the government focuses on mask, pyrotechnics, and standing on cement. This is why I have an issue, and this is why originally, sir, I spoke about priorities, because the priorities are all wrong. I mean, this we were speaking... I this debate, we'd like to talk about yeah. the, what the government wants to do in terms of protesting. We had a yeah. big debate yesterday about their plans when it comes to uh, dentistry. Yeah. Uh, in principle, mm. the, the argument some people make is, you know, you shouldn't be able to stand on, on a war memorial, and therefore the police don't need additional powers to try and combat that. But those, uh, that area has already been covered. And I think this is, we need to make a distinction between criminal damage and standing, making a, a call for a ceasefire, right? There's a, a, a complete difference. And so it's only just started. This conversation about standing on war memorials has only just started. I really would like to point out, I remember Andrew Banks in 2020 when I did my protest. Andrew Banks was a, uh, a gentleman who came down to protect the statues in 2020 against BLM, against black people like me. And then he ended up uh, urinating on a, a memorial 
for a policeman who was stabbed to death. Um, so this is what I have an issue with. We can talk about standing on memorials and that person potentially gets three years in prison and a £1,000 fine. But Andrew Banks, he got 14 days in jail. So basically, currently, right now, under the priorities of this government, if you urinate on a memorial or anywhere near a statue or a monument, you get 14 days in jail. If you stand on it, though... And talk about ceasefire. Well, actually, that's, oh no! That's very good. Let me let me oh, bring no. in Benedict here because he's been grimacing through a lot of what you've been saying. Uh, Benedict, uh, do we need more laws in this area? Uh, I think if you have a high trust society that involves people actually trusting each other not to misbehave, and once people transgress against that, actually, yes, you do. I don't think it's actually to do with respect. I think it's to do with provocation. Actually, what we had last time... What's wrong there with a bit of provocation? Well, because what we had last time when people... where there was this, uh, the suggestion that people might be uh, trespassing on war memorials was that thousands of people turned up and very angrily started attacking the police. So, actually, I think if that is a problem... That's then a sweeping I think statement. It... You just said thousands. Well, have you did, got facts did, to did back that up, did, sir? Did, did, thousands, was, no, did thousands, thousands of football fans... Did thousands of, did, did thousands of football fans not march on the cenotaph and start attacking the police. I'm no, pretty certain that they did. No, people did not attack yes, the police. Yes, they absolutely did. That was, that was the way. The that was, that was, that was, that was the way... To, certainly, that's the way that it was... Cer language. Certainly, that was the Let's way that it was portrayed. I certainly saw thousands. That's that. what the police said, was that thousands of people, predominantly football fans, turned up and marched to the cenotaph, and there was the potential for violence. But you can argue whether or not they were football fans either. But the point is, the point is, let's get back to your point, was that it was provocative for this to happen, and that's what caused a reaction. Yes, and this is the same, actually, when it comes down to pyrotechnics. What are pyrotechnics on a march often used for? They are used to launch at the police. They're not allowed at football stadiums uh, I'm sorry, for I'm, a very I'm, specific reason, I'm because they are used polite, as projectiles. That's why they're not used at... That's well, why they're banned at football stadiums. At what point stadiums. have you ever on, seen them on, launched at police? Imran, Please give, I, me, they give are me a day. Please. Please. So give us a day. Missiles are regularly us, thrown at police so during protests. So give us a day in terms of a pyrotechnics. I mean, the last, actually, please. the last football match I attended in Italy, I saw them being used. But you're talking about football matches. Isn't that funny? The last football match I attended in Italy, I saw them being all right, so now you're talking about Italy, a completely different country, and now you're talking about football. We're actually talking about... I mean, I can so I give like you, you examples... To to time ...where you saw pyrotechnics you like. being literally aimed at police during Iman, a protest. Please, Iman, if please. you would like me to go into the long and story no, just one example. We'll take of about football protests 20 seconds. in Italy being used okay, against so the police, no we can, it's not no answer at all, There's and no what answer. you're just doing is going, There's oh, no I'm going to pull lots of different examples out of the air. The police already have the power to ask individuals to remove face coverings in a specific area where they think a crime could be committed. Yeah. Why, in your mind, is that not sufficient? Um, simply because I don't think that what the police often have been doing at a lot of these marches is saying, well, we don't arrest people, for example, chanting anti-Semitic slogans, etc. We like and to racism. stand back and we like to wait and, and we like to observe. If actually you then have to wait and observe and you look at the footage of a march and say, oh, actually, we can't tell who's doing, who's actually doing the chanting because their faces are covered, I think actually that's not an unfair thing to say, right, well, if this no, is what's going to be happening at marches... No, you're not accurate. Again, sweeping statements. Have you been on to a... Have you been to a... I, I, I tell you what, for somebody who's, uh, for somebody who's offering a lot of sweeping statements, Guys, I'm hearing a lot of sweeping statements. You're wrong, Give you're wrong, you're wrong. You're wrong. Imam, this is Imam, all we seem to get, Because you actually Imam. are wrong. That's Imam. Imam. Hello. Imam, I do apologise. Where do you stand? on the face covering issue? See, it's interesting because I... It, for, for me, it comes down to two things. The hypocrisy of the fact that we spent many years, at, at least two from the police and this government talking about you must wear a, a face covering. In fact, we're going to arrest you. Obviously, during COVID, you, you don't remember that time where you were literally going to be arrested for not having a mask? Yeah. And now we've transitioned to masks. So that's interesting. But for me personally, it comes down to policing better policing, which makes their life easier. So if you wear a mask, it does make policing easier. That is something I will always subscribe to. And then secondly, in terms of safety, I've been on these protests and I understand how uncomfortable it may be, how uncomfortable people may feel being surrounded by people that are masked up because you could Theft, burglary, et cetera, et cetera, all different it, kinds of things. Isn't, isn't, so, right so, hang on, there. theft and burglary. Happen. But hang on, isn't masking <laughs> up, isn't masking up a risk? That's not a sweeping statement. It is a sweeping statement. Let, can I ask this question, <laughs> Iman? Time. Iman, can I ask this question of yes. you? Isn't masking up a response to surveillance? People don't want to be surveilled when they're going about their lawful rights process. Of course, and I'll be balanced in saying there are a proportion of people, just, just like we said, that cohort, that small cohort, not the thousands of people that protest, but there is a small cohort that come to protest to basically wreak havoc. That is the reality of it. And those people tend to, not always, tend to, 
wear masks. So some people wear masks because they don't want to be harassed by police in terms of racism, in terms of prejudice, in terms of just out and out being but nasty and, 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 having, and having police being nasty. And then there are a small proportion. The policy, which then makes it so political and clearly, as we've seen evidence in the studio, Highly <laughs> controversial. Thank you both so much for coming on. Uh, Iman, Benedict, really appreciate your time. And we want to know what you think as well. You know, clearly it's got, it's got us going in here because people care about this, the right to free speech, but also the right to feel safe when you're about in the street. And if there's a protest or demonstration going on at the same time, that makes you feel intimidated. So do you think the police should have more power to arrest protesters? Let us know what you have to say and we'll look through your messages. Uh, you can text us 87222, start your message with the word talk. But for now, let's move on and take a look at this morning's front pages. And let's start with The Times. It's an exclusive investigation. They believe that... An alleged Russian spy infiltrated Britain, gaining access to MI6, the Foreign Office, and even meeting the future King Charles. Shame on you, says the Mirror, as the Prime Minister is accused of being tone deaf, making an alleged trans joke, whilst the mother of murdered trans teen, Brianna Jai, visited Parliament. And the sun go with top sun as Prince William poses with Hollywood actor Tom Cruise at a charity fundraiser in his first public engagement since his father's cancer diagnosis. Well, let's stick with that story because Prince William spoke at an air ambulance event last night thanking the public for their support, saying it meant a great deal to his family. He was also joined by Hollywood royalty, Tom Cruise. Well, joining us to tell us more is world commentator Afia Hagen. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Prince William, it was a moment of sort of levity. Mm -hmm. um, there was lots of laughing. Mm -hmm. I didn't really realise he had such a good relationship with Tom Cruise. I love this I? photo. There's a bromance <laughs> here, isn't there? You, have, so you that, must have seen that photo by now. That it's is a stuff. bromance in the making, isn't it? And, you know, it's a really, really great cause and one that's really close to Prince William's heart because of course he used to fly air ambulances in East Anglia um, a few years ago and so yeah it's great to see him out great to see him smiling and laughing and joking and supporting this really important cause and also having a bromance with Tom Cruise and talking about uh, Top Gun slippers it, it, I would like some of those it sends a clear message though doesn't it because earlier this week we were talking about that wobble when we heard the, the shocking news that mm. the king had been diagnosed with cancer we obviously reflected on the fact that he was only uh, uh, the crown was put on his head just last year mm. and and we wondered about the pressure on yeah. Prince William and this is I suppose Prince William just t showing that the pressure he can wear it well yeah because it is going to be a lot of pressure and anyone knows when you have someone in your family who has any kind of illness a cancer diagnosis it's very very stressful you're worried about them you're worried about their their treatment as well as having a wife who's recuperating and as well as having that pressure literally of the crown, right? Impending. And it must feel maybe a bit closer than it did maybe a year ago or so. And so that's a lot for him to take on. It's a lot for him to shoulder. And this is kind of his way of showing how he will do it, that he's just going to get on with the job whilst acknowledging the fact that, yes, there has been some medical issues going on. He talked about the medical focus of the past two weeks and also, you know, thanked people for their support, which must mean a whole lot to him. There's very much the keep calm, carry on mentality that we mm -hmm. saw with Queen Camilla last week, now yeah. realising what she knew at the time that she Absolutely. was going about all those public events and, and maybe the similar sort of attitude from Prince William. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'm sure is really stressful is that he can't avoid constant speculation about the relationship he has with his brother. Absolutely. He didn't meet Prince Harry when Harry flew over mm -hmm. here. And in actual fact, Prince Harry made a very fleeting visit. Yeah, very, very quick. Had that 45-minute meeting with his father before King Charles went back up to Sandringham. But I think, you know, whatever was accomplished in those 45 minutes was a good thing. It's a good thing that he made the trip in the first place. Were you surprised you know, at the brevity of that meeting, though? Because there was an opportunity for him to maybe stay in Sandringham for a bit. Mm, I was surprised that it was quite quick. But this is the thing as well, is that when you're going through cancer treatment, whatever it is, and we don't know what this specialist treatment is. Or how gruelling it might be. Exactly. But you want to minimise, actually, the number of people that you have around you because you don't want to pick up your jams. Your immune system is lowered by whatever treatment you're having. So it could be a case of, actually, he just wants to keep his bubble small. He is having his weekly meeting with the Prime Minister for the next two weeks via phone rather than in person. That's another way of keeping his bubble small and keeping the jams away. I'm not saying that Harry's got anything, but maybe it's a case of the King's time from the treatment he just wants to be able to have that opportunity to rest I think it's great that Harry made the trip and he got to see him
some sort of analysis is suggesting that maybe this is an opportunity. They've had that meeting up mm -hmm. to 45 minutes. Um, let's just wait and see. Does anything get leaked? Does anything suddenly go public about what happened in that conversation? If it doesn't, that is an excellent first step in rebuilding trust. Yeah, and I think you could be right about that. I hope that we don't hear the details of that meeting, to be honest. Um, and it could be, you know, Harry is travelling next week. He's going to Canada for the launch of the Winter Invictus Games. Doesn't mean to say he might make another round trip. He might see him here in a couple of weeks, in a month, like you say, if we don't hear the details of that four to five minute conversation. And I think we won't, actually. I hope we don't anyway. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Really appreciate that. Sophia Hagen, uh, Royal Commentator. Lots to come here on Talk Today. Is Britain edging closer to full on war? And a Finnish airline is offering weigh ins for passengers. How would you feel about stepping on the scales before stepping aboard? We'll have writer Emma Wolf and journalist James Bloodworth here for a final look at this morning's papers. Stay with us, it's 22 minutes past eight. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it, they don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. A crossbow, a hatchet. Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows. Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat. Carry on, a horse crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Whoa! It's... Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq Khan, <laughs> brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that stuff is actually making him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are there a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. It's 25 minutes past eight. Now, we're going to have the weather for you in just a moment and snow to come. Uh, but just before that, let's give you an idea of what's coming up in the next hour. Is a world war edging closer? That's what intelligence officials have insisted. We'll cover that in the papers coming up next. Just before nine, we'll be asking, is it right that the controversial American journalist Tucker Carlson is interviewing the world leader, President Putin? And just after nine o'clock this morning, as the backlash against Rishi Sunak intensifies, we'll be asking a trans campaigner if Sunak should apologise for his joke whilst the mother of the murdered teenager, Brianna Jai, was nearby.
But That's now, a... let's get the weather. <laughs> snowing, we're, Jay. We're itching to talk to you, Jay. <laughs> I, I can tell, I can tell. The trouble is, we're going to see some snow today. It's likely to be disruptive, but it's not going to last very long because the whole reason it's there is because we've got mild air coming in with some rain and that's bumping into the cold air that we've currently got across the country. So for a while, we'll see some snow in some places over the higher ground. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Now, as you can imagine, this transition has caused quite a few warnings. Snow and ice for northern parts, rain in the south, and, as I say, that uh, sleet and snow through central areas. Here's the low-pressure system coming in. It's going to hang around through much of the weekend, really, uh, giving some unsettled conditions. But, really, by the time we get to tomorrow, we'll be seeing those milder conditions across many southern areas. It does look as though the weather's likely to settle in the, the middle of next week. Uh, signals for high-pressure building in there. But, certainly, for today, the warning for rain is down in the south, snow and ice through the central areas areas and for parts of Northern Ireland too. Amber warnings for the high ground of Wales and also for the Peak District and the Pennines. Here at uh, some altitude we could see a, a more than 25 centimetres of snow and with that some very strong easterly winds and that's likely to blow that snow around giving blizzard conditions. There's also a concern about freezing rain for North of Wales as well as that milder air comes in and the snow starts to turn back to rain falling on uh, frozen surfaces. And certainly many of the surfaces are frozen, starting off this morning with minus 12 over parts of Scotland, but temperatures close to zero across much of the country. Through the day, we're going to see that uh, rain belt slowly pushing its way northwards. And again, as it reaches the high ground of Scotland, it's likely to give some snow there as well. Obviously, the very cold air is there. And we've got a further pulse of rain coming in from the south. So there's also a concern for these southern areas that we could see over an inch of rain, uh, almost two inches of rain in some places and certainly some torrential downpours at times. Now, as we go into Friday, we've still got a warning out for parts of Scotland where we're likely to see some snow elsewhere. It's really much more unsettled, but that mild air is starting to make some inroads across the country. So pretty chilly for Scotland tomorrow with some rain and snow for uh, Aberdeenshire, rain for northeastern parts of England, and then for England and Wales. It's a rather untidy picture. Uh, we'll see one or two bright or sunny spells cloud in other areas, showers, and some of those merging together to longer spells of rain. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much, Jay. Our heating broke yesterday. Oh, no. Um, our kitchen is Baltic. Well, thank goodness you don't live in Wales. Well, no. Because we've got... Um, be even worse. ...our reporter, Nick Ellaby, there in, <laughs> in the, the snow. snow. With uh, people having a go at some skiing down the slopes. We'll so. see how he's getting on. I love those pictures of Nick in the snow. <laughs> Writer Emma Wolfe and journalist James Wadworth -Ho are here first for a final look through yeah. this morning's papers. I'm just papers. thinking it's going to be a very wet nursery one for me on the bike. Oh, well, there we go. A very wet toddler looking uh, at that picture. Do you have them, the... them front-loaded or do you have them in back. a trailer out the back? Back. With Not a, bit... a trailer, uh, just a bike seat. Oh, really, on the, on the bike seat? Yeah. Oh, I've, been, I've been through those days. But yeah. they're so wobbly. <laughs> but when you, you really have on the to... front, babies on the front and people sort of balancing them. Sometimes you've got one, one each end. And one each end. I don't know how you brave. get on the bike if you've got them both in. Very good point. Uh, maybe we should do this another day because we have other important issues to discuss in this morning's papers. Uh, James, let's start with you. This is in the mail. Uh, apparently, we are very near to a war, according to intelligence officials. What sort of war are we talking about here? Uh, so, yeah, the, the headline is war edging closer. Intelligence uh, officials are warned it's the threat of Russia and China. So, I mean... We, we kind of see war is al already has already come to Europe in the you know there's the war raging in Ukraine at the moment because Russia did invade that country so you've got a nuclear armed state uh, with expansionist ambitions uh, and it may not just stop at Ukraine it could be you know there's also Georgia Putin's ambitions extend to kind of uh, reanimating kind of the Soviet Union so you've got the Baltic states Georgia and also China is developing these new yeah, but supersonic missiles is missiles. Britain to war. Sorry? How close is Britain to war? I mean, if Europe gets dragged, if, if Europe gets further dragged into war, then, then there's, Britain's a part of NATO. So, I mean, if, if NATO gets dragged into war, then Britain will have to go to war as well. So you I don't think, think this is scaremongering? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't really think it is. No, I mean, unfortunately, I wish it was. But um, I think, I, I think the, you know, before Putin invaded Ukraine, none of us thought it would happen. 
it, we thought that would be scaremongering to mm. say that, but it did happen. It's, uh, it's, it's like that saying, you know, when someone tells you who they are, you should believe them. And I think in the case of Putin, that's and that, that, evident. Yeah. I think what's alarming is that we're seeing regions of, you know, increased tension in, in lots of, in various um, areas. Yeah. But what's also really alarming is the sort of, the reports over the weekend of how, just how very unprepared we are. How, you know, in terms of even just like military and kind of planning and you know, in the actual, the hardware. You yeah. know, we don't have factories pumping out the stuff that we need. We just don't have, we're not prepared in any way. Our armed forces are not ready. We don't have, we don't have people ready for conscription or training or anything. People and there's no don't secret want to sign up. either. Mm. No, there's no secret. And, you know, all the sort of top army guys have been saying we're absolutely not ready for war. And there has been talk of World War III looming. Of course, it's dramatic and it's, it's overstated. But, you know, there are lots of regions of the world that are deeply, deeply unstable at the moment. Um, let's move on, if we can. Lots of things to get through. Uh, Gordon Brown's been speaking about yeah. the cost of living crisis. He said, you know, there are some families, I think we know this to be true, that are too poor to buy things <coughs> like nappies. Yeah, he's been talking about, about the welfare state and the sort of shredding of the welfare state over the last 10 years. Um, he says up to 4 million British people, um, many of them who are in work, are trapped below the safety net that this is a public health and hygiene crisis. He's launching these, these uh, really, really excellent multi-banks, so a bit like food banks, but they're called multi-banks and they have clothes and bedding and baby products and furniture and hygiene products like nappies and things for families um, and I think you know I think he's highlighting a really really important point we talk endlessly about the cost of living crisis don't we mm. um, but you know this does actually have an impact on families who can't you know not they're not even worrying about fuel they're worrying about basics like mm -hmm. nappies for their children yeah I mean there are some people that say these multibanks are a good idea I visited one and did some filming there and, and yes it's it's terribly sad that people have to uh, go go to these places to get basic Safe. stuff but it's also an interesting contact point because uh, Citizens Advice and other services use it to try and pick up on the problems that people are going through during the cost of living crisis yeah. and, and providing help for them. So they've become quite an important contact point, mm. although no one ever wanted them to exist in the exactly. first place. Exactly, and you're right. And, and also for things like domestic abuse and things that, you know, fa problems that families and, and young mothers and, are facing. Mm. Um, they're, they're a very important point. That was, in the, that was in the mirror today. Um, looking at a couple of the papers this morning, James, there are things you can do that will increase your risk of Alzheimer's and things you can do that will decrease it. The decrease risk? Yeah, so are you I prepared mean... to admit to doing either of these things? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a talk no. today exclusive. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, if you, if you want to avoid Alzheimer's, you should take Viagra and not pick your nose. Yes, um, tell us more. I mean, these studies are... I mean, you should take them both, I think, with a bit of a pinch of salt because... You've got this observational study, um, which it's, it's you know it showed there was an 80, 18 eighteen percent lower chance of developing Alzheimer's um, for the participants who took Viagra, um, but they didn't kind of measure all of the variables. So it's mm. there's that saying of what is it? Correlation is not causation, um, and the nose picking one is. Uh, yeah, I mean that this has been going around for a while. It's because basically you can you can introduce infections and germs into your uh, nose the same way if you pick your nose after you've touched some you know uh, some surfaces with the flu virus on. You're more likely to get the flu. It's, I, it's but just I didn't know that germs could trigger germs. Alzheimer's. Yeah, I mean certain certain bacteria, yeah, can get into the brain that way and make you more susceptible to Alzheimer's. That that probably is more solid that research than the Viagra yes, study because the there's, there have been several studies that have that have said that in the past. There are so many other things that immediately would suggest themselves to me. Like if you're taking Viagra, you're probably in a relationship if you're using it for sex. Therefore, if you're in a relationship, that makes you less like you know Alzheimer's is also. Yeah. Uh, exacerbated or caused by loneliness and things like that. So not caused, or absolutely not caused. But I mean, there are lots of so many other yeah, factors no, that will feed that's into those exactly. um, to those findings. That doesn't make such a good headline, though. I'm no, exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Okay, Sorry, let's let's answer. maybe find. Well, researcher, actually, always a researcher. Emma, I wonder whether <laughs> yeah. or not this is a solid enough story for you in the Guardian. Overweight luggage can induce a whirlwind of stress for passengers. Finnish Airlines has a solution. This is really interesting. Haven't you? Have you ever gone through an airport which worrying about the weight of your luggage, and then especially in America got on a fl flight and realized that everybody is extremely large passengers have never been weighed uh, now Finn Air is this is a, a an airline in Helsinki um, at Helsinki Airport they've started a trial with voluntarily asking people will they be weighed and they've had about 300 volunteers of the passengers I mean if pass if, if we're trying to make planes safe and we're weighing luggage in order to balance it in order to make sure that the plane isn't overweight why are we not weighing passengers 
of course, it's a deeply, deeply controversial issue because are you shaming people? Are you making people get on the scales before they get on? So they're doing but this the for what reason the exactly? They're doing this but not for fuel-saving uh, reasons, no, but no. to actually ensure the plane is better balanced. To in I mean, well, I've been to on estimate a the weight of the plane. It seems deeply obvious. I've been on a tiny plane before where yeah. we had to be told where to sit <laughs> based yeah. on... Which is what always you, really worrying, isn't it? <laughs> you weigh, they're all great. They, do they, want, to lean, they want to lean too much really, in one direction. If you're getting... I mean, I think you could probably estimate quite An well average weight. average weight of the passenger who that comes in. That is so in. not true. But would you want to stand on a, a you know, when they, you put your luggage on but and you see it go up and then you stand on well, it see, next that's to That's a different it? matter. We are talking, and especially US domestic flights have a big problem with this. If people are 20 stone or 30 stone, that is a big difference to a passenger who's 10 stone. And yet we are told, oh, your luggage must not be over 22 kilo. Oh, it's over, it's 24. Sorry, you got to... I mean, I, I get the sensitivity completely. I'm not saying we should do it. But how can you not see that passengers, the weight of the passengers is as much an issue as the luggage? I think as long as you don't do it in front of someone, like as long as people you don't were sensitively by doing it in front of someone, people were sensitively to be slowed weighed. down even more. Well, they could airport. weigh you maybe when you go through security because yes, you've got it, to. That, well, that maybe be a bit. The way, number of your weight is not shown I've, to fellow passengers. It's kept away from them, but it's yeah. about but then what estimating they use it to the do? weight, the total of the plane. weight of the passenger. Okay, all right. Uh, let's move on to a final story in the Express, James. This is an issue quite close to my heart. Yorkies are on the way out? Yeah, I mean, Yorkie biscuits, which I'd never actually encountered This is anyway, not a biscuit Yorkie, let's be clear. It's a Yorkie biscuit. Yeah, I, I, I've, never, difference. I've never seen these, Pardon? but breakaways. <laughs> How are they doing? A biscuit they... Yorkie is a Yorkie with biscuit inside it, like fruit and yeah. nut. It's got fruit and nut I inside think, the chocolate I, bar. I think the breakaway biscuit story is, I mean, they were a staple... As a schoolboy, they were a staple disgusting. of my yeah. lunchbox. I'm a club man. And I, Breakaways I, are awful. I do <laughs> feel, chocolate. feel bad that they... I know clubs but you are might good. be sad clubs that then good. people who like breakaways no longer can have them. I'm very sorry for your loss. No, Kit Kat all the way. Yes. These are too biscuity. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Kit Kat, Kit Kat Chunky is one of the most popular bars it in is, the world. It is kind of sad to see these things, these things um, going out when they've been a part of your childhood, I think. And that's what the story is. Yeah, but it, it's, it sparked some outright rage that... Nestle is, is phasing these products out. So, certainly as far as oh, breakaway is concerned, great. no one seems <laughs> to have ever heard of Yorkie biscuits. Suddenly <laughs> people get obsessive about these things that they weren't actually buying. I think yeah. it's a marketing weed. Well, and, then, then, and, and then they'll like suddenly be back with Avengers and everyone will be, back, be buying be breakaways. Again. Yes, I wish we could try a Yorkie biscuit because I think we all know that breakaway... We could see a Yorkie biscuit. Uh, yes. I've never, never come um, across one. Uh, well, unless it's a biscuit Yorkie. I know we're going in. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you <laughs> Thank both you. so much for being with us. Now. This <laughs> Not surprised. Um, we'll see you next week. Right. Let's talk about something that we will be talking about a lot over the next few days because the Met Office has issued two amber weather warnings with snow and ice expected to cover North Wales, parts of Shropshire and the Pennines today. Well, with rumours of skiing, our talk today <laughs> correspondent Nick Elevy is live in North Wales. So one of those warnings we should be uh, serious to start with is in place. Uh, Nick, um, tell us more. More snow enough to actually get down uh, on, on two skis? Yes, good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. Uh, there has been a bit more snow in the last hour. It's keep coming down here on Horseshoe Pass. We're in the sort of uh, Cluidian range of hills just north of Flangochlan in North Wales. Chris Morris here, top skier who lives down in South Wales, has driven all the way up here to, to have a go on this this morning. Chris, describe what it's like skiing in, in sort of this, these conditions and well, this wind. It's really tough. The wind's blowing in my face. The snow is still a little bit thin, but um, it's coming down pretty thick and fast. So this afternoon, it should be a lot better, I think. We've filmed a couple of Chris's runs. You can probably see them on screen. He's been up and down a couple of times for us on these paths here. Chris, what are your plans for the rest of the day? Where are you going to go? Are you going to, how long are you going to stay out for? I can't stay too long because I've got a sofa getting delivered this afternoon. So uh, I think I'm going to have to go for another run. OK, Chris is off for another few runs. He's got to get back to Pembrokeshire to have a sofa delivered. But uh, up here in North Wales, that amber warning for snow is now in place. So from 8... 8 a.m. this morning through to 3 p.m. this afternoon. And then that second amber warning in North England on the southern Pennines and also the Peak District comes into force at midday. And that amber warning, obviously one step up from a yellow warning, means that rural communities are likely to be cut off. Travel disruption is more than likely. We've already seen a lot of trains uh, delayed in this area and also in the south as well because of high winds. Up here in the hills, these winds are absolutely blowing right into my face at the moment. North Wales itself 
which is getting a lot of snow on high ground and now through the morning should start to see more snow on lower areas as well. There's lots of school closures up here, so Flintshire, just to the north of here, there are 85 schools shut, nearly every primary school in, the, in that district is shut. And then Gwyneth, Powys as well, number of schools shut there. And then in Northern England, basically where they've got that amber warning for snow from Bradford down to Stoke, a number of schools in that area shut as well. And people just urging, you know, authorities just urging people to take a bit of care. There are not too many people on the roads up here at the moment. We've seen a gritter this morning come past, but the, you know, the issue is, are we going to be able to get back to our hotel for breakfast, let alone get back to London in one piece? Obviously, we'll let you know, guys. Thinking about breakfast, Nick, we want to keep you out there all morning. This is one of the most entertaining <laughs> segments that I've seen. Are you, are you wrapped up nice and warm? Well, how cold is it where you are? You, the wind's obviously blowing and there's plenty of snow around, but is it, is it getting chilly? It's about freezing. The wind is up, but obviously I've got my thermals on. I've been in a few storms and blizzards now on this job, so I'm kind of used to it. Tony, the cameraman, is nicely shielded under the boot of his car, so he's all right. I'm here <laughs> it, bearing the brunt of it for you. Nick, thank you so, so much. Uh, stay warm. Also, maybe check in with Chris the skier, who seemed very anxious Did to get away. Didn't want to be on camera, Chris. <laughs> like, he would just rather be skiing. <laughs> Definitely. Or collecting um, sofas. Joe told us earlier, actually, that uh, the coldest temperatures, I think minus 12 uh, in some parts of Scotland, she'll be here uh, in the next hour to update us exactly on the weather because, you know, there is obviously a serious component to this. Lots of schools being closed, travel disruption we've already been talking about, and those amber weather yeah. warnings kicked in uh, at 8 o'clock today. We'll keep you across it here on Talk Today. But there are still lots more uh, to come. A big debate ahead because the US journalist Tucker Carlson has made some pretty serious headlines by sitting down to interview Vladimir Putin. That raises the question, should dangerous world leaders be given a platform by the media? Well, the spectators, Freddie Gray and the Ukrainian MP, Kira Ruddick, will have their say. And remember, keep getting in touch with your views. This is Talk Today. It is 17 minutes to nine. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the streets or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet? Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat. Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Oh, 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 there we go, on this show. It's carry on, what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, this... Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka Joe flavoured vape, <laughs> I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, that's the way it goes. 
I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 14 minutes to nine. Now, American media personality Tucker Carlson has confirmed he will, or he already has, interviewed Vladimir Putin in what will be the Russian president's first interview with Western media since the invasion of Ukraine. The announcements face quite a lot of criticism. Some are saying that dangerous world leaders shouldn't be given platforms. Well, Carlson hit back at criticism with a video he posted on X. Here's what he had to say. Not a single Western journalist has bothered to interview the president of the other country involved in this conflict, Vladimir Putin. Most Americans have no idea why Putin invaded Ukraine or what his goals are now. They've never heard his voice. That's wrong. Americans have a right to know all they can about a war they're implicated in. And we have the right to tell them about it because we are Americans too. Freedom of speech is our birthright. We were born with the right to say what we believe. That right cannot be taken away, no matter who is in the White House. Those Western journalists not bothering to interview Vladimir Putin is perhaps something people might take issue with. Here to discuss it is Freddie Gray, deputy editor of The Spectator. But first, let's speak to Ukrainian MP Kira Rudik. Uh, Kira, what is your thought process when you heard that Tucker Carlson was in Russia and was going to interview Vladimir Putin? First of all, I wonder why he did not come to Ukraine to witness all the terrors and all the results of the war that Putin started in Ukraine. And second question is, uh, isn't he manipulating, trying to show the world some justification of what Putin has done? I think when we are talking to dictators, there is no space of giving them the floor because they will use it for propaganda and uh, because we have seen them doing that beforehand so many times. Well, hang on, hang on. Hang on. There's, there's, two, there's two things here. You have an issue with the interviewer, but you also say that you have an issue with Vladimir Putin being interviewed at all. Would, would, you, would you say, therefore, he just should not be given the platform by any journalist, by any network? Let me ask you this. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well. Would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? Well, nodding in the studio is Freddie Gray of The Spectator. Freddie, you've been uh, writing about this. I mean, what, how would you answer that question from Kira? Absolutely. If I was a journalist with an opportunity to interview Osama bin Laden, 100% I would. What are the uh, dangers The Guardian of published like this, uh, an editorial piece mm. by Osama bin Laden, and I think that was the right thing to do. But what, what are the dangers, though, with giving someone like Vladimir Putin a platform like this? I don't really think that there are dangers. Uh, I mean, you know, you could assume that he will somehow magically brainwash everybody who watches it. Um, but I don't think people are that stupid. And I also don't think we're living in, in the Soviet Union. I believe that um, every journalist who possibly could, who's not a coward, would take the opportunity to interview Vladimir Putin, and they should. I think what people will say, inevitably, unless Tucker Carlson... Uh, you know, calls Putin a murderer to his face and storms out of the interview. I think people will say it was a softball interview, he's a useful idiot and so on. But what's the point in telling Vladimir Putin in an interview that he's a murderer? He's not going to suddenly hold his hands up and go, yes, I am. The fact is, even though in many ways Vladimir Putin is evil, uh, he is one of the most important people in the world right now. And the point of journalism is not to divide the world up into good guys and bad guys, it's to give audiences context, information, insight, and so on. This is apparently going to be a two-hour interview. Some of it may be pretty boring. And from what I've seen of Vladimir Putin, he can be pretty boring. Um, but he also might provide some pretty interesting, a different perspective than we have seen. This is not to take sides in the war, and I think it's very silly that we think about journalism in this way now. But, Kira, is there not an argument there that by allowing Vladimir Putin to have this platform, 
you're giving him enough rope. He is going to give away information. He's going to give away perspectives that will be incredibly useful to the understanding of what he's trying to do, killer though he is. What is the question that you're trying to ask him? And what are the answers that you're looking for? Of why did he do what he has done? Or like, what is he going to do next? I can tell you that right away. He's going to continue the war for as long as it uh, as he can do that. And he will try to expand Russia because he was very open about that in his previous statements. But when you're say, uh, saying that he can say something interesting or explain things very interestingly, I can tell you one thing. Yesterday, uh, there was another attack on Kiev and there were at least four people killed. So I wonder what interesting could be about what he can say about that or what could be an interesting angle on that. He's a criminal. He should be treated as a criminal. You don't give a criminal uh, space to be talking to everyone, explaining why he's doing what he's doing. It, it, there's a danger here, Freddie, isn't there? That, that using this interview... And there's a, there are reasons why Putin would have said yes to Tucker Carlson rather than the many other journalists who, yes. I would contend, have been bothering to try and get an interview with Vladimir yeah, Putin. Think... Uh, he knows that his message will go straight to the Republican base, which Tucker Carlson speaks to. And these are the people who have some influence over the purse strings when it comes to uh, America sending weapons over to Ukraine to help the Ukrainian cause. If that has the effect of weakening the resolve of American politicians, then this will be a big success for Vladimir Putin and a really bad situation for the, for the Ukraine. Well, I think you're right to say Tucker made a mistake in uh, saying that Western journalists haven't been bothering. They clearly have and they haven't got anywhere. Um, again, though, I come back to this point of assuming that people are going to be brainwashed by Putin. I mean, we don't... We, we, people are capable of critical thinking. We can hear Vladimir Putin talking and we can say, no, that sounds like a lie, no, that's propaganda. We don't have to be propagandistic ourselves in response to Putin's attempts to convey his own propaganda. And I think it's very odd that journalism has moved away from... This has happened only really but, in but, the but last few years. Context is everything. In every is. situation, and Tucker Carlson, we know, is somewhat dovish on Putin. Would it yeah. not be better... And I know, I know you're not going to get that interview, but would it not be better to send a neutral, independent, fierce journalist in there to ask those questions rather than worry about what Tucker but Carlson's bringing to the Then you have a question of access, because there's got to be something in this for Putin for him to be able to say, well, yes, I, I'm going to do the interview. And you're both, you know, experienced interviewers. You know that often softballing softballing, it's called, is a better way of getting interesting answers out of people. So I think it might be just a bit different. We've seen people say to Putin, you know, did you order the assassination of... And he doesn't hold his hands up and go, oh, you've got me. Mm. He says no, he, he, he probably lies. Kira, are you not fascinated by what Vladimir Putin might have to say? It's going to be a two-hour-long interview. Surely you'll be watching to find out what your enemy is thinking. Well, first of all, I want to add to what you've been saying before is that people were trying to get interview with Vladimir Putin, but you know what is actually happening to journalists in Russia who are trying to have a balanced and open opinion. They appear in jail and then their international community is trying to get them out of jail. So there is like absolutely no question to why Tucker Carson is being allowed there because he will be helping propaganda. And answering to your question, Nick, imagine somebody that you really love being killed in the worst possible way. And imagine that the person who did that, who ordered that, would be allowed to speak about that, how much it would hurt you, knowing that instead of being prosecuted, the person who ripped you apart or ripped somebody you loved apart did the worst thing to them, raped, tortured, murdered, they, he will give, be given a space to speak because it's considered interesting. It's considered fascinating. Well, it is not for us. For us, it is considered to be very painful that two years in, the world still thinks you can talk to Vladimir Putin, you can discuss things with Vladimir Putin, uh, and, and, and not just decide that he is a war criminal, which he is, and just gather all the forces to fight him. Uh, I mean, obviously, I come at this as a, as a British journalist and not a Ukrainian politician, and I, and I don't feel as emotionally about it for obvious reasons, and, and I can quite understand uh, those feelings. Um, however, I go back to this point that, you know, yes, Putin shuts down journalists and doesn't allow free speech in Russia. We allow it in the West, supposedly. And I was quite shocked yesterday to hear a Guy Vohlstadt saying that the Europe should consider sanctions on Tucker Carlson for going to interview uh, Vladimir Putin, 
we're losing sight of what we're supposed to be about in our defence of the West, which is free speech, freedom of conscience, um, a media that isn't propagandistic. Mm. Um, we need to get away from that very quickly or we will become uh, a kind of Soviet Union. Freddie, thank you so much. Great Kira day. as well, we really appreciate your time and your honesty and your candour from both of you on this debate. The interview and we will understand be your very strong feelings and the people of Ukraine's feelings about this as well. Yeah, the, the debate will... Uh, well, the interview will be aired uh, later on today. Lots more still to come on this programme. The parents of the murdered teenager, Brianna Jai, say the Prime Minister should apologise for his degrading and dehumanising language. Lots and lots of texts on that. Do keep them coming in. We'll read them out after the news at nine o'clock. This is Talk Today. It's four minutes to nine. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. A crossbow, a hatchet... Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword and a, sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Oh, <laughs> where are we going on this show? <laughs> it's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa! It's like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq Khan, <laughs> brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple, the downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, <laughs> I can have one, but not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that stuff is actually making him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Nick Wallace and Rosie Wright. A very good morning. It is nine o'clock on Thursday, the 8th of February. You are with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Well, pressure for an apology. The Prime Minister is accused of stirring up the trans debate while the mother of the murdered trans teenager, Brianna Jai, was visiting Parliament. Protest crackdown. People who climb on war memorials or try to hide their identity during demonstrations could face jail under new government plans. And William's wingman, the Prince of Wales, teams up with Tom Cruise at a charity fundraiser, thanking supporters as he appears in public for the first time since the King's cancer diagnosis.
And there are plenty of weather warnings today for rain, snow and ice. All the details coming up shortly. Very good morning to you. Now your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nick. Good morning. The father of murdered transgender girl Brianna Jai has said the Prime Minister's comments yesterday were absolutely dehumanising. Peter Spooner has joined growing calls for Rishi Sunak to apologise for what's been described as degrading comments in Parliament. Brianna's mother Esther was present at Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak said Labour leader Sakir Starmer had U-turned on his definition of a woman. It came shortly after he paid tribute to her murdered daughter. Conservative commentator Benedict Spence has told Talk Today he thinks the PM shouldn't need to apologise. Whilst making a joke might have been in poor taste, being able to speak freely about the immutable characteristics of sex uh, shouldn't be a controversial topic. And I think actually to use the tragic murder of an individual to try to browbeat people into not discussing it, I think is as in poor taste as joking about it. Labour is set to announce it's ditching its major environmental policy to spend £28 billion a year on green investment. It comes amid stark warnings by scientists that global warming exceeded 1.5 degrees Celsius over a year for the first ever time. They're urging immediate action to curb carbon emissions. The government's expected to announce tough laws to clamp down on protesters. Protesters who climb over war memorials or try to hide their identity could face a three-month prison sentence and a £1,000 fine as part of the proposals. While campaigners are calling the new measures a threat to everybody's right to protest. The Prince of Wales has said public support means a great deal to his family following his father the King's shock cancer diagnosis. William was seen undertaking public duties for the first time yesterday since his wife Catherine underwent surgery. He thanked the public for their support at a star-studded charity fundraiser for London's Air Ambulance, which was attended by Hollywood royalty Tom Cruise. But William didn't see Prince Harry in his fleeting visit to see his father. The Duke of Sussex is now back in California. Well, Talk TV Royal Editor Sarah Hewson says what happens next will be hugely significant. Whether that meeting between Harry and the King means greater communication by telephone, FaceTime, for example, uh, from between California and Sandringham, that would be a, a step in the right direction. It's also about whether there are any leaks of those conversations, because the royal family are really concerned that private conversations that they have had have ended up in the public domain. And a new study suggests men who take drugs like Viagra for erectile dysfunction may be reducing their odds of developing Alzheimer's disease. A study found that men who took drugs to combat the issue were potentially less likely to develop it than those who did not. Well, the charity Alzheimer's Research UK says the findings are encouraging but called for larger studies to confirm the results. You're up to date with the headlines. We'll have another update at 10 o'clock. Emily, thank you so much. Let's get straight to our top story today. And there are calls for the Prime Minister to apologise after making what some are describing a trans jibe in Parliament while the mother of the murdered teenager, Brianna Jai, had been visiting. Yeah, it's all caused a bit of a stir, especially as the Prime Minister and Sir Keir Starmer had only just been paying tribute to the victim in the chamber moments earlier. Have a listen to this. Mr Speaker, this week the unwavering bravery of Brianna Jai's mother, Esther, has touched us all. As a father, I can't even imagine the pain that she's going through, and I'm glad that she's with us in the gallery here today. But it's a bit rich, Mr Speaker, to hear about promises from someone who's broken every single promise he was elected on. I mean, I think I counted almost 30 in the last year. Pensions, planning, peerages, public sector pay, tuition fees, childcare, second referendums, defining a woman. Although, although, in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. Of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, shame. Well, joining us to discuss this is The Sun columnist Trevor Kavanagh. Very good morning. And also policy and campaign manager at Mermaid Charity, Tammy Hymas. Tammy, we'll start with you, if that's OK. As you watched that interaction in Prime Minister's Questions yesterday, what did you make of it? Hi, Rosie. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Um, I wanted to start by saying that you know, every single child deserves safety. Every single young person deserves the right to go to school without being bullied. What we had in the case of Brianna J was somebody who their murderer said, her murderer said that she would scream like a man or a girl, he asked. So for me, what we're having is a, a a massive need to dial down the tone of this debate. You know, trans youth should not be a punchline at the moment, especially in the context of what happened to Brianna. So for me, um, 
I feel that we really need to dial down this debate that has been totally blown out of proportion at the moment. Uh, Tammy, I, I don't think trans youth was being the punchline of a joke. I thought the Prime Minister was having a go at Sir Keir Starmer for not being able to define what a woman is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really important that we actually get back to the heart of this, right? Brianna was a trans woman, a trans girl, who wanted to live her life safely without fear of harassment, without fear of bullying. Um, and these kind of jokes, which use trans people as the punchline, are not helping to reduce that harm. Look, we've seen already... Sorry, sorry, Tammy, Tammy, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. What, what was using trans people as the punchline in that joke? I thought Sir Keir Starmer was the punchline of that joke for his inability to define what a woman is. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 the point is that the joke was about trans people. The joke was about trans women. Um, and that was what how Bri Brianna identified. And, you know, we've seen that hate crime has increased last year and the year before. And the Home Office own report said that one of the main reasons for this was the press and media coverage, as well as the rhetoric from politicians, which uses trans people as a political football, rather than thinking about, you know, that these are people who are very marginalised. Yeah. No, 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 I absolutely take your point, but don't, don't, don't Tammy, I absolutely take brilliant. your point. Tammy, Tammy, and I absolutely, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I absolutely take your point on that, but do you not think it's important to be able to define what a woman is and for politicians to be able to do so? And for people to disagree about what those definitions are? What's really important about this debate is not about definitions, but it's about safety. It's about the fact that every single trans young person deserves to be safe. And what we had with Brianna was uh, the judge saying that transphobia was a motivating factor in her murder. Um, you know, we need to end the, the, the punchlines, the jokes, <laughs> where trans people are not treated as humanely as they should. We need to start listening to trans young people. You know, I was in a workshop with 10 trans young people last week um, talking about their experiences in education. Every single one of them had felt that they hadn't been safe at school. They had experienced bullying. Uh, and many of them, you know, actually felt that they couldn't even be honest about their own identities while in education because of the harassment that they faced. So, you know, the reality of this issue is not about definitions. It's not about what's going on at PMQs. It's that trans young people on the ground need to be listened to and they need to have this debate toned down because at the moment it's blown out of all proportion and it will cause more harm if we don't start listening to trans young people. Tammy, hold there. I'd like to bring Trevor into the, into the debate. It was unwise for the Prime Minister. I don't see why it was unwise. I don't think it was a joke. I think it was a serious point. This is a political issue. Which it was is, a joke. It, and... it was a jibe. Yeah. It wasn't a joke. There was no well, funny, there's it... nothing funny about that. Well, why did the back bench behind him laugh? Uh, that's another matter. But the fact is, this is a serious political point, and it's a red button issue for Labour. Because I think that one of the reasons why uh, Keir Starmer leapt upon it with such alacrity was that they know that this is an issue that does actually activate and worry voters. And it's been demonstrated only a couple of weeks ago in Hackney, where a council seat in a very, very safe Labour ward was suddenly taken by the Conservatives after the Labour candidate was disciplined for trying to say that a definition of a woman was that you couldn't be a woman if you had a penis. And she was effectively deselected as a Labour candidate for saying that and then reinstated. And the row that ensued lost Labour that seat and the Tory candidate won by a 53% margin. That is why uh, Keir Starmer was so outraged yesterday. And, and, and it seems... Like, what, what I don't understand is the conflating of the two issues. We, we, we've got Tammy's point about safety being paramount for any citizen of this, this country. And you've also got the political question of what a woman is. They've been conflated deliberately. Yes. And now we have this discussion that we're, we're having because, obviously, it does press trigger points on both sides of it. Do you think, politically, the Prime Minister was being insensitive and unwise by making that point, which was clearly pre-scripted, with Brianna's mother in the chamber? Well, I, I guess you could argue that if you wanted to, but I think this is a serious point that needs to be debated openly. And I would think that even Rihanna's mother would possibly agree with the point that he was making, that you need to be able to say that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. In this modern society, and the way that it's being twisted to suggest otherwise is an abuse of the language, and I think of the, of the whole uh, discussion on gender. This debate is, is going to go on, I'm sure, today, because Brianna Jai's father has asked the Prime Minister to apologise. And what we're hearing, Tammy, um, from Number 10, is that seems very un unlikely. To, to what extent does an apology actually help or, or solve anything here? 
I think an apology is a recognition that these comments are not appropriate. And what it recognises is that Rishi Sunak... Sorry, just to ask, when you say the comments, which comments is it that you think the Prime Minister should be apologising for? Well, this isn't the first time that Rishi Sunak has actually made jokes at the expense of trans people. Uh, the fact he did it in the chamber in front of Esther Jai has given it much well, needed... Sorry, Tammy, we have to go back to this. He was making a joke at the expense of Keir Starmer's inability to define what a woman is. He wasn't making a joke at the expense of trans people. I, I, I disagree with you there, Nick. I think the joke was about trans people. It was about trans women and, and whether someone can define it as women because <laughs> Brianna J was a trans girl. Rishi Sunak continues to make jokes even when her mother was in the chamber. But that is an example to me of just how far this debate has lost all of its humanity. You know, what we need is... is Absolutely, coming back to the experiences of trans young people. You know, I was speaking to Eddie the other day. Eddie is a young trans person. He's been to three different schools because at each of his school he was rejected um, and because of because of his identity. But we've got trans education guidance that's just been released by the government, which is effectively saying that trans young people don't exist. It denies their very reality. This is so strongly felt in the community and, and in the service that we offer. We have more and more people calling up, feeling the stress, feeling the hostility that this debate is bringing to them. So, you know, when Rishi Sunak makes these comments, when he, he he uses it as a punchline, as you admitted, a jive, a joke, whatever you want to call it, it makes people less safe. It makes this debate not about people's humanity, but about a political football issue that is actually going to cause more harm in the future. And as Trevor, the, um, the Prime Minister did. didn't want to be having this debate today. It's the second time this week that he's done something maybe ill-advised or slightly awkward. You know, he accepted that bet on Talk TV with Piers Morgan about sending migrants uh, to Rwanda before the next general election. He's arguably been insensitive yesterday. Maybe he's not very good at some of the sort of interpersonal parts of this job. I think that uh, Rishi has his uh, strengths and weaknesses. But, I mean, this is an election year. Every word he utters will be scrutinised and poured over by the opposition for the sort of outrage that they can confect on things which are actually perfectly reasonable statements that any human being might but be making. But is it not his given... job as a politician to make that job <laughs> for Labour much harder than he's currently doing? Well, I, as I say, I think that the, there was nothing wrong in what he said yesterday. Uh, I think that Tammy is conflating, and deliberately and calculatedly conflating, what was not a joke at all. It was a jibe at the inconsistency of the Labour leader, the Labour opposition, on a very fundamental point of human biology. There's so much more we could get into on this. Trevor, hold right there, because we're going to talk to you about police protest in a, a moment. But Tammy Hymas from Mermaid Charity, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Because still to come, we're seeing what Just or Boyle think about those new police powers on protests that we've been talking about this morning. You're watching Talk Today. It's 13 minutes past nine. Do you stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it, they don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet... Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press... Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a horse crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword and a, sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Oh, there we go on the show. It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa! I like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop 
creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, <laughs> I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that stuff is actually making more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it goes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. It is four, no, 16 minutes past nine. My <laughs> eyes are going. 16 minutes past nine. The Home Secretary will announce new protest laws today that will give the police the power to arrest demonstrators using face coverings and will make it an offence to carry pyrotechnics at marches. The new measures are all going to be introduced as part of the Criminal Justice Bill. It also includes a potential three-month prison sentence for climbing on war memorials. But do we need it? Still with us is the Sun columnist Trevor Kavanagh and joining us from Sheffield is the Just Stop Oil campaigner, Dr Bing Jones. Uh, Dr Jones, do you have concerns about these new powers? Will they stop you from causing mass disruption in future? Yes, I've got enormous concerns about these, these uh, moves. Look, we're, we're just not paying attention. We're, we're ignoring a massive, massive problem and instead we're talking about people climbing on <clears throat> war memorials uh, and wearing face masks. But do, do, do these it's people not take... It's been a hard-run fight. Yeah, it's Dr. been a Sorry. really hard-run fight to, ha to have the power to protest and the, and the powers of free speech. These are hard-won things. And we've got a government that's obviously failing and that's just doing what failing governments always do, which is to try to demonise people and blame other people. This, this is not about climbing on war memorials and wearing face masks. This is an attempt to stop all protests. And the most worrying thing about this bill <clears throat> is the fact that it removes the defence of protest <clears throat> when you're in the court of law. That's really worrying. But do you, uh, not think, do you not think that protesters clambering all over war memorials, which many people find deeply offensive and disrespectful, actually detracts from the point of a protest, the right to free assembly and to make your voice heard in a civil way? I, I'm not interested in climbing on war memorials. Nobody wants to upset people uh, unnecessarily. And, and, and hardly anybody has climbed on any war memorials. People, hardly anybody's wearing face masks or setting off fireworks. This is a government ploy to avoid talking about the fact that they are increasing the dangers to the to 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 the climate, and <clears throat> it's a ploy to stop them uh, appearing to be clamping down on free speech. This is a slippery slope, is and this, it's really really sad. Trevor, is this uh, an infringement on, on freedom of speech? Well, I think that uh, this isn't freedom of speech. This is bullying. These uh, marches are not uh, peaceful demonstrations in the sense that. Uh, they are uh, following the law. Or the, the, there are lots of laws that could already be brought into play. On well, this, so this is, is this law, uh, or this new bill, solving a problem that doesn't really exist because we've already got the tools to solve the problem in the first place? I think so. I think there are lots of... I mean, just taking, for example, breach of the peace. When you block roads and stop ambulances getting to hospital and people getting to work and going about their lawful business, that would qualify as a breach of the peace, which is a traditional... Uh, measure which the uh, police have at their disposal and have done for decades, if not, sorry, centuries, uh, they have uh, ample power within that law already. And the, bi the big problem with bringing in new laws like this is that the police will ignore them or, or enact them in a way which is like pushing on a piece of string. 
Nothing will happen as a result of this. Very few people, I suspect, will end up in court as a result. Well, Dr Jones, these new laws, what impact, if any, would they have on the type of demonstration that you take part in? They're, they're not going to work, are they? We're facing an absolutely terrible situation. <laughs> the top of the BBC's website today is talking about the fact that we've already breached 1.5 degrees. We're... Dr. Jones, sorry, the, the debate we're trying to have is, um, is how protests should be uh, executed rather than uh, the specific thing you'd be protesting about. Uh, in your ability to exercise your freedom of speech and go out and demonstrate, will these new laws have any impact on that? Well, I, I disagree with you. I think that these laws are about trying to stop people from protesting. No, it's not going to make any difference at all. People will go on being moral and being concerned about what's really, really important, and they won't be put off by a failing government trying to be, um, trying to get more votes. Look, we've got record after record after record being broken. Ordinary people are not stupid. They, they, ordinary people can see that there are floods, that there are fires, uh, that there are exceptional things happening all the time. And you can't just go on making more and more laws to try to solve the climate crisis. Ordinary people are, can, can see it. I'm a doctor. Okay. I've been spent my life trying to look after people. And we've got a government here that seems to be ignoring what seems to me like, like a, almost like a cancer. Well, the, the climate is a kind of a cancer. And what they're saying is ignore it. Don't do anything about it. Just go on living your life. No, we can are they just saying you have a right to peaceful protest, but don't cause disruption, don't stand on war memorials, don't mask yourself up and then commit mischief whilst you're on these marches? Just stop oil. And all climate activists generally are ordinary people. They don't set off fireworks and climb on war memorials and, and put masks on. We're willing to, to stand up for what we believe and... and People go to court, go to prison even. But th these are moral, ordinary people doing what should be done. Look, our king has got cancer. And the people have been saying it's really good that he's been diagnosed early. We have got the most massive problem with the climate. and We're not dealing with it. And instead, we're just trying to blame people who are trying to get the message across. Dr it's Jones, let me just bring in disaster. Trevor very quickly, because this is the second time, Trevor, we've had a campaigner on the programme that says the frustration for them is that they want the government to be taking the issue they're campaigning about more seriously than a crackdown on protest. Yes, I mean, it's quite dismaying to listen to someone like Dr Bing rambling on about things which have absolutely nothing to do with the point that we're trying to discuss here. Whether or well, not I mean, people it's should be he able, considers to... it's very important. Well, I know he does, but uh, these, this is what the sort of protesters' movement—they think they're given some sort of divine right to bring the whole country to a halt, to achieve an absolutely unachievable objective, which is to stop oil, so to stop us using energy. Well, and what the Home Secretary wants to do today is to make it more difficult to have most disruptive protests. We have to leave it there. Trevor, thank you so much. Dr Bing Jones, really appreciate your time from Just Stop Oil. That is it. From us today, that's all we've got time for. David Bull and Sarah Hughes will be here, though, from 6 o'clock tomorrow. Kev and Alex are up next, but first, here's the weather with Joe. Have a good day. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. We've got rain, sleet and snow pushing its way northwards today as milder air runs into the colder air currently across the country. And this is triggering quite a few warnings. Snow and ice for these central areas, rain for the south where it's going to stay in force until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. So these are the kind of temperatures we're looking at for today. Two or three degrees Celsius only for the northern parts, whereas down towards the south we could see 11 or 12. And then through the course of the day we'll find that one area of rain pushing its way northwards, likely to turn to snow over the high ground once again and a further area of rain coming in from the south so some very wet conditions some very challenging driving conditions not only will we see snow over the high ground but also some very strong easterly winds and that'll give blizzard conditions for a while and then of course tonight where the cold air remains we'll see a, a fairly widespread frost and the risk of some icy stretches on the roads it will be quite a bit milder down towards the south though and that's very much the setup for tomorrow still the risk of some snow particularly over parts of scotland 
more in the way of rain to uh, further south, and we'll see some showers down through these southern areas, some of these merging together to give some longer spells of rain. Temperatures around 4 in the north, 11 or 12 down in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. What a happy start to Monday. <laughs> An Arctic blast, the royal family are up in arms, more problems with migration. Welcome to Monday. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it. No officer with your level of training wakes up in the morning and says, what a great day to go and shoot somebody. This is done really as a last resort. It's done in a response, emergency response. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. There's a way to deal with knife crime, right? And I, I mean, OK, it doesn't deal with the underlying problems in society and all the rest of it, but it actually stops people getting killed. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet, Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Sorry, yeah, I've Did got you... a microchip in my left hand. Let's see. Um, can we? Can you hold it to the sword. camera so we can see? Uh, Where is it? I can't yeah, see Yeah, you it. can't see it because it's actually inside the web of my hand here. Where are we going on this show? <laughs> it's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, this... <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. If I turned up to this show having drunk mm. this vodka, uh, and was incoherent and useless, I would never be invited back on this show again. So there is a... Uh, JJ gets invited back every time. Time. <laughs> Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. Mm. Bailouts were amazing. Thankfully, they're illegal and you can't find them anywhere. But if you have one, you know, we can go after it. Just for the